You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And I'm Jared Mounts. Uh, Thomas, I'm super excited uh, to Legend. talk to this guest today. And uh, he goes by Doc. Um, Such Gale- a Western name, no, like Western a name, Western Ex- thing, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, Galen Hethcote is his official name, and uh, we met. I don't know if it was eight, ten, ten years ago. I know he talks about the old shop. He remembers the old shop, um, and so he's been lo- a loyal customer since then. Uh, great angler. Uh, we were talking. He's near in retirement, but he he doesn't let any grass grow under his feet. He fishes all over. Um, anxious to hear his story. Um, we're, we're going to talk about the Shando River, the Susquehanna River. Uh, they take trips uh, up north to Erie, Niagara. He's fished down south. He just got back from a trip down there. Um, and then we're also going to we, doc because he is a doctor. He has a practice here in town. And in fact, Dad and I both see him, and he's an excellent doctor. Um, been very helpful for our family. Um, and then we're also going to talk. He's got a, a benefit raffle. Um, for suicide, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. We're going to be talking about that as well, which I think is so very important. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll, we'll wrap that up and talking about that, and you get your raffle tickets here in Jake. So we'll be talking about that also. Uh, well, let's bring Doc in now. And, and Doc, w- the first time you walked into Jake's Bait and Tackle, the old one, do you remember when that was? Oh, yeah. I, I and what your experience well was when you walked in? Jerry was kind of essentially in the uh, the closet store, we, we <laughs> said. Right. And, uh, and I was just amazed he had – every lure the the top brand lure that you would uh, think about using locally it was not the typical you know bass pro or cabela lures jerry had to he had the inside stuff that you know that you wanted to get and and it was it it was you know just become a hangout for me every time i'd stop uh, go by i would uh, you know need to stop and see what jerry had in you that's right Uh, of course he might have to shuttle stuff around in there to be able to 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 uh put it out to uh, yeah. for view because it was such a small space but uh nevertheless it was it was a it was a, a wonderful little store and a wonderful start to this yeah this great uh bait and tackle store that we're very fortunate to have here in winchester we thank you that place was so small you had if you had four or five people in there like one one or two had to leave before the other ones would come in i mean it yeah. was literally small but I it was packed in there tight oh, it was awesome um was awesome. and i still laugh too because every time doc comes back from the trip probably should announce this don't want his wife to hear it, but he, he he'll go away for two or three hours for a couple of days and when he comes back, he inevitably will stop by Jake's first on his way home just to let us know, give us an update yep. about his trip, which I think is pretty cool. Right, have to have to update on the trip. That's you know? right. And I've learned a lot from him. So, But let's start with kind of how you got into fishing way back into your sure. childhood. Where did you first sure. start into well, this? Well, I, I grew up in uh, Middle Tennessee, about uh, around 50, about 50 miles outside of Nashville, a little place called uh, Hickman County. I uh, grew up on a farm. My dad was a truck driver um, and, uh, and farm part-time when he wasn't out on the road in the truck. Uh, we had a little creek across, across the road from our house. It was called Garner's Creek. And, and I guess at an early age, uh, well, I'd say early age, about the sixth grade, fifth or sixth grade, uh, I started fishing in the creek. Uh, I actually, I fished by myself. I mean, mainly I, I kind of uh, picked up uh, the interest of, uh, fishing around in ponds locally around the around the community there and the farm community and and uh, I didn't really get to fish with my dad that much because he was busy you know I mean he was always on the go it seemed like and uh, so I, I I got involved just kind of fishing for brim and red eye bass and stuff like that there in the creek and the little river not, down at the mouth of the creek was called Piney River and as I got older I was you know kind of finding myself doing more river fishing and and that's essentially how I got my start. Just uh, you know, kind of on, on my own, grab a wasp nest with the take the larva and go out to the pond. And uh, I don't know if you've ever is that right? Yeah, oh yeah. Go to, hmm. down the barn. You can knock out a wasp nest, and you'd have plenty of bait, and go over to the pond or down to the river and catch catch some brim. And and I just kind of really f- developed a love for fishing. You know, it was kind of like my uh, I don't know. That was, I don't know if you say escape, but it was kind of where I found joy. You know, it was out on the river bank or creek bank fishing and uh and that's and that's um uh, and uh, it, uh, my interest and love for fishing just really has kept growing and even to today you know i still have a, a love for fishing and and uh so 
I, as I graduated from high school, I went on to college. And then, of course, uh, my college years, I kind of fell aside. My, my fishing kind of, uh, you know, fell aside. Is that in those Georgia? Years. That you went to school? Well, I went to uh, re college in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, okay. at uh, David Lipscomb University is where I graduated from undergraduate. And then from there, I moved to Atlanta, Georgia, and went to pharmacy school at Mercer University School of Pharmacy. And while there, uh, that's uh, – that's I fished some locally in the uh, Stone Mountain. They had a little lake there at Stone Mountain, and I'd catch myself going over there really? fishing a little bit. We yeah. visited that last yeah. time we were yeah. in Atlanta. Yeah, um, there was actually some good bass in that. Okay. Uh, uh, so I'd do a little fishing over that there. That is a nice and, little, had a little covered bridge there right, I saw. Right, hmm. and uh, uh, met my wife and my uh, wife at the time there, and we started a family, you know, during those years. And uh, uh Later on, I as I worked well, I worked as a pharmacist for uh, several years, and I decided to go back to medical school, or try to go back to medical school, and so I applied, and, and fortunately I got in medical school, and then I made the big decision to go on to medical school. Of course, I had three three small children at that time; that was going to be a big undertaking, you know. Why did you make those decisions? Like, it's for, to going from an outdoorsman. There, there are so many career paths. Why did you choose pharmacy and then like that? And then well, you know, school? and if you could move the mic a little bit closer, it'd be good okay. too. You just look at the things. Uh, that's that's a uh, answer to that. Thomas would be as I when I was in high school. I, you know, I didn't have a big interest for school to be honest with you. And uh, it was one of those that I could you know take it or leave it. And, uh, and most of the time, I felt like I needed to leave it. So you know, I was not a an A student by any means. I think, you know, I really? probably split my class halfway in two between the bottom half and the upper half in high school. And, and, um, but, uh, so, and my, my, my father, he, he, he went to the eighth, my father had eighth grade education. My mother had really? 11th grade education. So neither one of them ever attended college. So, you know, I didn't really have, I didn't really know what I, you know, anything about college or, you know, what would be beyond high school. So I didn't really know if I was going to stay, work on the farm, get a job locally, in one of the factories or whatever. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. But I, I, one of my, my, I had an older brother and he was, he was just out of the military and he was attending a community college uh, in a nearby town, Columbia, Tennessee. And uh, he, uh, he, you know, he was, I, would go visit over there for you know, him and his, he was married and had children. I'd go visit them at the time. I said, you know, I'm, I think I'm going to give this community college thing a, a, a whirl. So, and see what it's about. Um, so I started uh, at the com local community college there in Columbia, Tennessee. And you know what? It was just, it was so different than from high school. Uh, I was actually taking, and, you know, studying, you know, things I did not study in high school. Uh, and I was able to choose what I was wanting to study. And right. boy, I really got interested. You know, I said, this is not bad. You know, it's just pretty good. So I found myself going on to the community college. They had a, a little medical program there for uh, lab technicians to be a lab technician, you know. And uh, so I kind of got interested in that. I said, well, you know, it's, that's pretty good. You know, making pretty good money over here at the local hospital versus me working at Chevron gas station over here, uh, and, you know, in, the, in, in town. So I... Uh, entered that program and completed it and became a medical lab technician. And my interest in medicine at that point just started growing. You know, it just kind of snowballed. I went from there, went on to uh, college in, uh, uh, in Nashville, David Lipscomb, finished up my bachelor's. And uh, I really got interested at that point in going on pursuing further medical education, something. So I got kind of got interested in pharmacy at that point. Uh, you know, I visited a couple of pharmacy schools. I said, man, this would be, be good, be a good career. And uh, so I applied to Mercer University there in Atlanta and unfortunately got in and went on, got my doctorate degree in pharmacy and uh, then ended up doing a residency in pharmacy at uh, Emory, through Emory University at Grady Memorial Hospital and started working then as a uh, clinical pharmacist and uh, at that point you know once again it was I was involved in medical teams at Grady Hospital where uh, in, in working in the intensive care unit and it it's it just kind of it, it's just kind of like a door was opening and you further you go in it the more interested right. you would get and next thing I know I was, I was approaching 30 and I said well you know I wouldn't mind applying to medical school I really didn't think I would get in I mean I was why did you want to apply what what in your life in that moment? Because I think all yeah, this is 30. fascinating. Because yeah. yeah.
we had Scott on and, and you have these people with these backgrounds of they're not great. They're yeah. not successful in high school. And, you know, you know, in, in my life and with all my education, I was pre-med and I almost had this decision to go and I wasn't good in high school. And I've had kids that I've taught that weren't good in high school. And they really think like to be a doctor, you have to be a 4.0 student and you can do calculus in your head backwards. And if you don't have that gift at age four, right. you can't do that. Right. And it's so interesting to see these people, in these different backgrounds, like you, it, it's not necessarily true. Right. And anyone can strive to greatness if they put their yeah, mind to it. That's and, right. and that's not, that's, I, I want to make sure that's highlighted here. And the fact is that pharmacy is a, a good job. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. And, then, and then you have kids at this point now. So you've already, you're not going to work at a farm. You decide that you're going to do this. And now you've, you've hit this one thing that most people in their life would be like, this is awesome. Yes. But now there's something in your heart or your mind that's like, I want something else. Like, what, 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 what was At any time, like not yeah, an yeah. orthodox way of doing it, just unorthodox, but it, it, the time was right for you. Yeah. yeah. I, I think, I think working with uh, the physician teams I worked with at, at Grady Hospital in Atlanta, I just kind of, I said, you know, I would like to be maybe one step closer to, you know, being the, you know, the care provider, uh, physician. Uh, reason I did not think I'd get in was, like I said, I was by this point I'm approaching thirty, and uh, been out of school for many years, you know, uh, and have to go back and take the medical college entry exam and all this and uh, general chemistry and, you know, these subjects that I've been many years in the past. So there was a, was it a five year thing that you, if the classes lapsed, you had to retake or something like that to retake chemistry, organic. Oh, I, I didn't have to go back and take anything. Like I just had but the, the MCAT uh, uh, test gotcha. covered subjects that would, you know, that were, was involved, you know, that uh, involved those, uh, that subject matter. So I applied and I got in. I mean, I had a, a real good interview at Mercer University, and I think because I was uh, I already had a, a degree, and I was an older. I wasn't a typical medical student. And I had family, and you know, I was older, and so uh, fortunately, I got in, and uh, and then from there on, it uh, you know, I was able to was able to survive the four years of medical school and get through that, and and uh, then uh, I left. Uh, that was the uh, medical school was at Mercer University in Macon, Georgia. And after that, I did my medicine, uh, internal medicine residency at the University of Tennessee in Chattanooga. And that's when I got back fishing While because I was right there at, at Chickamauga <laughs> Lake and right there at, at Chickamauga Dam. And wow. me and a buddy of mine that was a resident also there, we, anytime we could get, we would we had a flat bottom boat. We run there, had two, le two electric trolling motors on that boat. We would zing out there around the dam and fish and you know we caught some nice large mouth nice small mouth so you know at this point my you know I'm, i had the love for fishing already there and then this just re-sparked my fire and um so i finished my residency and from there moved on to uh bainbridge georgia I, uh, and that's uh i don't know if y'all are familiar with bainbridge georgia but it's it's right on the it, it's right at seminole lake seminole in mm -hmm. georgia and went down there my first job as a physician uh i call myself an old country doc and uh, had a, uh, a, a, a great practice there in Bainbridge and got to uh, know Jack Wingate. I don't know if y'all are familiar with Jack Wingate. He's, uh, he's one of the old original bass guys and oh, he's, okay. he's in the actual uh, fishing hall of fame. Hall of fame. Okay. And he had the Lunker Lodge there in, uh, oh, wow. at, at Wingate's Lunker Lodge. And we used to, I used to go down there fishing. I had a 14 foot flat bottom aluminum boat and an eight horsepower motor on it. And I would go down there and, Jack say, you going out today? I said, yeah, I'm going to go out and see if I can get them, Jack. He'd, he'd say, he'd tell me where to go. He says, the mother boats can't get over in these spots. You take your little boat and go over here or go over there. And, and I'd come back in. He'd say, you got any? He would always take a picture if you had a nice fish. And I'd come in. I actually caught my largest uh, 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 largemouth bass there at Wingate. Right? Lake Seminole? I, lake Seminole there? right there, yeah. Wow. It, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lake that joins, it's it forms by, the, uh, it's formed by three, those three bodies of water, the Chattahoochee River, One, two, Flint River, and uh, Big Spring Creek. Wow. And I used to fish a lot out of Big Spring Creek and uh, in there. So that was a, uh, but that was a fun experience and meeting Jack and a lot of those guys. And they have a lot of bass, they have a lot of the, you know, bass, you know, Bass Pro Elite Series tournaments out of Bainbridge. As a matter of fact, they just had one this year, not too long ago out of there. And that, but uh, so that was a, a great place to to live and kind of get. I, you know, I, I lived on a little lake called Lake Douglas. Uh, I had basically a lake in my backyard. Push my boat out in the evening when I get home or whatever, and could fish 
pretty much any time after work uh, when I, you know, when I wasn't doing, you know, wasn't busy with something else. And were but, you a uh, general practitioner or what oh, was your internal medicine, general, general, medicine, general okay. internal medicine. So, you know, it's a lot of primary care stuff. And of course, down there in the country, you know, you're the doctor, you're the doctor. They don't, people didn't weren't didn't, it didn't matter if you was internal medicine or whatever. They, you know, they expected you to, no. you know, here, doc, I'm yeah. sick. I need this or whatever, you know, this, the, I've, this, is, this is wrong with me or, and you didn't have a lot. We didn't have the, you didn't have the, the specialist. Problem, we didn't have the, the, the subspecialists and specialties that we have here in, in this area. And, and then I, you know, after I worked there for about six years and then found out, uh, this, a job was, I knew some, had some friends up here, found out the job was available, uh, here in Winchester from a retiring physician that was in practice at Winchester internal medicine. He'd been there for 30 something years, I guess. And so uh, I said, man, that sounds like a good opportunity. The guy I was in practice with at Bainbridge uh, was at a, a point that he decided that he was going to look into go become a professional bass fisherman and work emergency room part time. So I said, well, you know, this is a good separation time for me to, you know, pull out too with uh, Randy Bartholomew, who uh, loved to fish as well, uh, decided to change his career or modify his career at that time. So I moved up here, took a job. I've been here for about going on 21 years now. Wow. And, uh, and so, you know, get to Winchester and, uh, my, basically most of my fishing had been largemouth, you know, green fish. So, and I get up here and I hear about all the, the smallmouth bass fishing, you know, and this and that. I said, that's great. I still had my little, my little boat, my 14 foot, eight horsepower motor on so i guess it was 16 foot 16 foot with made horsepower motor on it and and uh so you know i'd fish around and didn't really know what i was doing out here on the river you know the and obviously had to be careful uh fishing the shallow shallow rivers but uh and i was fortunate enough to meet jeff wolford mm -hmm. I, I know you i don't know if i know he's a heck uh, of a stick uh jeff Wolford, he really took me under the wing to start showing me around this area uh, fishing for smallmouth. Um, and I tell you, it became an addiction. I mean, he he is one hell of a fisherman, and I was just so thankful that he, you know, showed me, you know, took me in to, and showed me what, around. What was so uh, addicting about it? Oh, man, that fight. Oh, my gosh. You know, that thump and fight, you know, <laughs> and uh I tell you, I just, uh, like I said, I've, it's, a, it's become an addiction, I guess you'd say. Uh, met Kenny Gano. Uh, he introduced me over to uh, Lake uh, Holiday. Got to start fishing over there some. And we uh, were talking about, you know, Kenny was in yesterday. He was the one we were talking about line, not to, you know, reveal uh, Wolfer's secrets, but we were talking about line, line size and all this stuff. And he's talking about a jerk bait and uh, another angler got him turned on the jerk bait. Jerk bait. Um, and but anyway so we, we talk about line and but wolford's one that'll throw a four pound test oh yeah yeah like a gaunt minnow and throw it out there and catch a four or five pound smallmouth and oh you know i've seen him bring in a 14 yeah. pound lake trout lake trout four pound you know, test, four line pound test and get it in. drag set right and right you know so it's kind of like and your your braid power fishermen guys are like flipping out because like there's no way you know yeah. four pound yeah, test but that's it right. works, you know, for right. him. I mean, what was the biggest cultural change then going from a premier like Seminole for nice, big, fat green watermelons to four pound test Dinkin? And like, like, what was the biggest, like, oh, shock? Well, you know, I mean, I guess it was, it was, it, the area, you know, being, I guess you'd say famous for smallmouth fishing, it was just a, a new chapter of life for me, you know, I mean, and uh, sure, I love still fishing for largemouth, and but uh, uh, once I started getting, I ended up getting a jet boat, uh, and uh, and once I got a jet boat and started able, was able to fish some different waters, and it really become you know I, the the smallmouth fishing really become my my prime target. But like I said, with Kenny Gano, uh, you know he he was a big influence on me fishing out Lake Holiday and and on Shenandoah River. And I met Jeff, uh, met Jeff Miller, who yep. is a heck, rat. all the, these yeah. guys are all, all, I mean, they are anglers. excellent, yeah. 
Excellent, excellent anglers. Yes. Uh, and uh, and they got years of experience on yes. these rivers. I mean, I'm talking 40 plus years exactly. on the Shenandoah probably. And Jeff uh, Miller introduced me, to, I guess you would say, to the, the Susquehanna River. Right. Uh, as, uh, for the most part, uh, showing me some spots up there uh, mm -hmm. to fish. Well, and, of course, Jeff Wolford also, and Kenny had also uh, fished the, the Susquehanna and I showed me some, uh, a lot of stuff up there. But And those guys need to know, and, and everybody needs to know, just listening to you talk and how exponential relationships are. And what I mean by that is, like, you came up, you developed a relationship rapport with them, they took you fishing, you, you, you found a passion there. And then I meet you, and then, like, I, I'd been to the Susquehanna before, but never really on a jet boat. And Doc has an, an express jet boat. And so we went to the new river, we went up to the Susquehanna and, and it's like, so that learning is exponential in the fact, you know, they taught you, you taught me like a lot of things and like we teach each other, but it's like, you know, I'll never forget too, up on the Susquehanna, the whole chatterbait jackhammer debate. Well, he's just flat wearing them out on the front with a, with a jackhammer and I've got just a regular chatterbait and, and part of it too, he's a better fishman angler, oh, no. but he's, but he's, and it to me, and then even your trailer, I still sell you know, some of those little rage, baby rage, you know, trailers instead of a swim, you know, more of this. And that, you know, came from him. And I'll show people pictures of these big, you know, big old susky small mouth with big wide tails yeah. and say, and then, you know, so people, so it's just, again, it's that shared knowledge that is passed down through different, you know, right. companions and different relationships. So I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. And that's the beauty of, of here. Uh, we've got such mm -hmm. a great uh, fishing network of yes. people. It's, it's just, and, you know, willing to show you, you yes. know, I mean, I, I was blessed because, you know, they've all, you now all these people I'm talking about have been a big instrumental part in my f developing my fishing, correct uh, you know, patterns and tactics yes. for this area. I mean, because I, I, you know, it's all new to me. And, uh, and then we migrate started, uh, uh, me and Kenny actually decided to venture out up to Erie one year, probably around 10 years ago. And. We went up there a couple of times and said, darn, man, we went up there. It was going in the fall of the year and went up there and we'd come back. We'd spend two or three days and we'd come back, like, have caught maybe two fish. Say, man, I'm never going up there again. We would have done a lot better on Susquehanna, you know. And you're talking like Presque Isle Bay, I think. Yeah, well, Presque Isle, Presque Isle mm -hmm. Bay. And and then the last time he and I was up there, we said we was never coming back, but we bu bumped into a local up there. Uh, and uh, he said, you boys come at the wrong time of the year. He says, y'all need to come up here springtime you know, come up here around 1st of May. So we decided to do that. Uh, we got talking with, uh, we talked with uh, Jeff Wolford. He had his center console boat and big enough we could get on the big water and stand the waves. And so we went up there one, one spring, uh, about three years, the third year of men, Kenny had been going up there and man, we just wore smallmouth out. Yeah. I mean, I mean you you're know, talking like five, several, six pounders. Oh, uh, well, four or five four, pounders. you know, four, four, four you know, three fives. to yeah. five pounders, yeah. you know, and that first trip, I think that, that, or that, that year, you know, we fished just a few days and we had, you know, 300 plus fish. I mean, just nice fish. Wow. And that was just amazing. Went back the next year and had over 700 smallmouth in about four and a half, about four, three and a half days. Wow. And once again, you know, just, enormous size fish you know three to five pounders and occasionally you would get a six so then and then you know of course wind caught on and then and then you now you get a lot of a lot of folks from this yeah, area goes, goes up there and fishes that bay and they kind of became addicted with it from the same point not, maybe addicted is not the right word but having to hit the right window like i know you would plan oh, like yeah. three different trips in a spring different weeks to make sure you hit the right window yeah, you have to hit the right yeah. window that's right and then through jeff and and floyd we started going to migrate they introduced me up to the niagara river and lake ontario so that's kind of how the I'm niagara gonna, river yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. really you can now and you've, and you've now gone from three to five to four to six i yeah. mean i think you all said the best five would have gone 30 plus pounds on one of yeah. the last trips yeah. on the niagara yeah. river coming out of, is that near more kenny near and Buffalo? i kenny and i was up there we had uh our five big fish uh couple years a couple years back was uh five smallmouth was 31 pounds nine ounces <laughs> mm. and me and floyd floyd wharton yep. is another one he floyd He's really uh, was a big inspiration to me uh fishing up there at the niagara along with jeff miller and uh around in that area but floyd and i was up there one fall and we had our we had 29 pounds and uh 12 ounces almost 30 pound bag and five fish 
And then, so, I mean, you know, it was just, it's just a different, you know, it's just a different world. I mean, you know, those... find this place. Well, and as you're looking too, I think we talked about this off camera and I think, you know, in an era of tournaments, Bassmaster Classics going on this weekend, there you've is. got a lot of, you know, youth tournaments, uh, you know, club tournaments, you know, there's, there's tournament, 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 and you pay an entry fee, membership fee, you, you pay entry fees at the, at the ramp, you know, and it's, and it's, it's fun. Don't get me wrong. Competition. But what you guys are doing, I really respect. You have you have a small group of guys, and it grows to whatever, and then the camaraderie, and you're gonna you're just pulling your money, and you're gonna travel up and stay, and just fish for three or four days or five days, and you change where you go, and you just it's it's there's we're missing that, and I know Thomas, you've talked about mm -hmm. this, we've talked about this um, at all levels, like almost take the competition out of, of it, fun fish. And just go and, and travel and, and because there's so much out there to offer. And oh. I think what you guys have done, and here's the thing, it, it happened over time. It's not like you didn't know them before coming to Winchester. You, you, you've you met them, you know, through here, different places and just, and, the, and you decide, hey, we're going to go fishing together. And you guys have stuck together and you guys are really close friends to this day because of that. But you've, I mean, the. I mean, that's just, you, you'll never forget those memories of catching those big, big bass. So is this the Niagara that you're talking about right here at Niagara Falls? Is this right. Mm -hmm. Where did you guys launch? Oh, we down at the mouth of the river. Sort of okay, right below the dam. No, no. There's a dam? <laughs> not, not falls, not falls. Oh. Yeah, that's, um, huh. of course, you know, I've never, never fished way up in that, that area, but it's usually the part of Ontario down the it's mouth like of the, the river. It's like in the middle of a city. <laughs> Well, the problem you have is like with boat like I have is you, you know, you can fish the river a lot. Of, you know, you, you got to be careful on the lake. You have to yeah. pick and choose your when you can go out in the lake. But you uh, the river is kind of like the river. You know, it's you, I mean, still, you got to be careful there as well. But, you know, the type boat we have, the jet boats and stuff, you can actually fish that river. Uh, it's just a great great place and down to st lawrence we fished down to st lawrence river on the other side of ontario that's once again another great as you well know fishery um and it's just 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 different fishing just like what jared's talking about it's just a new adventure we kind of like the coolest place you coolest know? river outside of this area that you went to um i i guess probably i have to say uh the ontario the uh Niagara River is probably one of my favorite fishing spots, uh, it, followed by the, uh, I mean, I, I, outside of Winchester, I'd have to say Susquehanna. I love Susquehanna River. So first, Niagara, yeah. then Susquehanna? Well, probably, I mean, you know, one I can access uh, the easiest, obviously, is Susquehanna. Yeah. I love Susquehanna so, River. So outside the Susky, it'd be nice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, probably it's a fun place to go fish. You know, obviously, it's a long trip, uh, but it's a great place to go. Spend a few days. I, I love, I love trying to do it once or twice a year. Hmm. Uh, but uh, the Susquehanna River is by far outside of the Winchester area my favorite. So on know. the Susky, I mean, you fish below Harrisburg, above it, all the way up. So what what would you what would be your top two, two I, places on the Susky that you like to go in and out of? Uh, Liverpool, probably Liverpool. Liverpool. Uh, yeah, it's probably one of my favorite areas up there to fish. Is that above Harrisonburg? Yeah, mm -hmm. that would be. Uh, and then you know, this year, of course, I ventured down down south uh, to on you know wanted to fish Tennessee river chain. So that's kind of my trip for this spring. Um, you just got back from that. Yeah. You? Just got back from that. that had a good trip down there other than the weather being cold. Is, is there anything between all these rivers that you fish rivers from, you know, Mexico to Canada, are they all the same or do they have little differences? Oh, I think, I think definitely have differences, but still, you know, it's still like river fishing. You know, you're still looking for the eddies and, you know, you're still looking for the same thing. You know, it's the same thing I look for on Shenandoah River. I look for on Susquehanna River. I look for, okay. you know, if you're fishing one of the, uh, either the Niagara River or uh, St. Lawrence River. I mean, you know, those, those things is still what, what I kind of key in on. And that's, you hmm. know, once, once again, uh, it's I, I call it river fishing and then looking back growing up as a, a young you know a teenager fishing duck river and piney river in tennessee i mean that's looking back on it that's where we caught our fish there as well you know you're looking at these various spots reading the water yeah, and, yeah. yeah. i've always water. heard that and a lot of things i've read is 
once you learn how to read the water and like you said, learn the features of seams and, and eddies and slack water and current and how the food and the food and, and you're so right. And then you can take that from East coast to West. And like you say, North to South, and it's pretty, there might be subtle differences, whether it's grass or, you know, hard bottom or different things, but for the most seasons and water temperature, but for the most part, the fish are going to set up the same and respond the same, you know, regardless of where you're at. Mm. That is, that is fascinating. So what would you consider your home water, the Shenandoah River then? Yeah. That's where you fish yeah, the I most? So. Uh, yeah. What, mm-hmm. what portion of it? Is it, is it the North Branch, South Branch, Main you Stem? Know, I, I fish, I like, of course, depending on the water levels, it's kind of my limiting factor, but I like fishing anywhere from uh, the canoe company all the way down, you know, to probably uh, the uh, Shenandoah Farms. Mm-hmm. Some between those, t- those areas would mm-hmm. probably be, you know, that waters in between there is probably yeah you know, i've never really fished way down the, the the bottom end of the shenandoah river uh much below the uh, uh seven you know seven bridge uh, and of course never uh, probably up to goonie creek maybe is the farthest up i fished shenandoah for the most part and uh but once again it's just a beautiful we're, we're so fortunate to have that beautiful body of water here locally that we can fish and i mean i've really i mean i've had some just some awesome fishing days on the shenandoah river i mean just unbelievable days uh, and you know this river you know we kind of hit a, 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 a kind of a rough time to shenandoah and had the fish kill but boy is it coming back and yeah. coming back with vengeance and i tell you i just we're we're so fortunate and blessed to have that river. And then the Potomac nearby. I mean, you know, I'm starting right. to, that's another area I'd like to start, going to the Potomac. you know, branching out in. I've been some fishing up there, but not a lot. But, boy, I'm looking forward to exploring some more of that, that, that river. That place. Yeah, we I just mean, had a customer just, send me some pictures just yesterday. Know, he's he's we, catching some good smallies up probably. there. And you bring up a good point because, you know, we, yeah, it is a small body of water. It's narrow. But one thing I keep coming back to, there's so many miles of it and there are concentrated areas like you're talking about. And yes, there's, there's, it's going to see a little bit more pressure than others. But when you consider from route seven and you're just talking Virginia up main stem, the North and South branches, which some of those areas on the, on the North fork, you can't get the jet boats on, but, um, up above the dam, um, and now you're not even talking about West Virginia, well, let's um, let's talk about that because Potomac. like not everybody is like like just for everyone to understand since we have customers like all over the place right. that listen. So when we're talking, so I think this is a good illustration, and, and maybe I'll, I'll uh, let me get rid of the uh, the o- satellite overlay because I think it's a little, little bit a little bit easier for everyone to see. So what I'm showing you guys right now is for our podcast listeners that I'm watching on YouTube, we're showing the north, the south, and then the main stem. And mm-hmm. then so with this map, hopefully it'll, it'll all pop a little bit better. There we go. So right here is Front Royal, mm-hmm. right here. And then this would be from Front Royal down would be the main stem. Right. And then so this portion here, is this what you guys call the north or the south fork right here? Right there's the... Uh... North Fork, see, I think. That's a North Fork. North Fork is going to be on... The bigger one? Uh, North Fork is going to be Woodstock, Edinburgh, um, Town. South Fork is going to be Front Royal, Bentonville. Um, yeah. So we got this here, which is right next to 81. That's going to be the North. And that's going to be your seven bends from, yeah, Woodstock, Town, Charlesburg. And this, this here would be... South Fork. Gotcha. Okay. So... There you go. And so there is differences in these two, correct? Yes. What are the, what are the differences? Well, I mean, I think the north the north is going to be a lot smaller, and it's also very rural. You do not have the public access. Your public access there is going to be Woodstock and Strasburg. And like I say, you're not going to see jet boats on those sections. It's going to be canoes and kayaks. Really? Okay. John boats. Um, a lot of private low water bridges, not a lot of public access, uh, less pressure, less fished. Uh, south Fork has two or three different uh, canoe companies on it, a lot more public access. Your river guys, jet guys are going to be able to run more of that water um, on the South Fork. You got Egypt Bend further south that can you can actually put your prop boats on that. Um, so then this is the ramp. south. This That's is this south. is where this is jet boat country. It's basically Correct. the south. Gotcha. Correct. Okay, I didn't even know this. And yeah, especially if you get the water level. You yeah, know, water level, right? right. And, yeah. and, of course, the guys that know the river a whole lot better than I can run it a lot, mm-hmm. you know, once – and another thing too, oh, Doc, that I keep oh, thinking about is like, yeah, Egypt Bend there is big, you know, big prop boats. 
Um, hmm. Just how many years people have been fishing this? Like we're naive to think, well, we just somehow found her. We're the only ones to fish it. I ran a guy down in Richmond, two guys, brothers. They they have been driving from Richmond to to fish the Shenandoah River since 1975. Wow! Right? I mean, I'm 48 years old. I was born in 75. So yeah, like who who would have ever thunk? But um, not that you get a lot of that, but but it is a lot of people have been fishing for a long time. Guys like Basil, I mean, yeah, I grew up absolutely. in this area, been fishing it since oh, they were kids. Thank the years experience. Oh, oh my gosh, goodness. and they've I been mean. fishing it for all these years. And so, is there more pressure? Yeah, there might be some. I mean, I think they're you know, but it, it, I don't know that there's any more than there ever was. If that makes sense, I don't know. I'm not an expert on it, but I always think about that. Yeah. You know. I think it's the evolution of knowledge and competition. It's, it's no different than, let's say, warfare. Like, there's an evolution of it. If you don't keep up, you're going to fall behind. Whether, you know, you go from a flintlock musket to a bolt-action rifle. I mean, it's just, and when you have fishermen, they're like, well, back in the day, I, all I had to use was a leech. And it's like, right. yeah, and that was in black and white 1940. Like, yes. now, things have evolved, and you have to keep up with it. And it's the same thing if you're deer hunting. It's yeah. the exact same thing. So, is the fishing good? I think I think the, exa- the Shenandoah now way better than it was five six seven years ago 100 yeah, right. oh, night yeah. day but you got to stay up with it you got to keep up with the and times what's evolved too is these boats they're running these inboard mm-hmm. jet i mean Actually, especially ones they're running i mean it's like you now you would do a float trip you'd get in a canoe you know the kayaks weren't even that big you didn't have kayaks you had canoes and john boats like you were saying earlier do you have a picture of your jet boat online somewhere i, I could throw it's an up. express um, what is that an express it, well i, I yeah, he just had that. some work done to yeah. it I'll send it to you. you it's it an express. Well. It's a, I, I've got an express Center with an console. outboard. It's an 80 horsepower, 80 uh, horsepower jet. It's 115, 80 head. And, uh, center it's, console. It's center console. It's, it's designed. I bought it up in uh, Pennsylvania on the Susquehanna, uh, big B boats at, for specifically for fishing on the Susquehanna. I mean, you know, the river fishing, river, not just yeah. Susquehanna, but river fishing in general. But, uh, I'll tell you what, it worked good down in Tennessee up there in that around that, uh, uh, Wilson Dam with all them rocks. Mm-hmm. I was able to go places that other boats, or, mm. or I that- may have been crazy for going there, but <laughs> of course I said, you know, we we got through it okay. Uh, but it was, uh, it was. Uh, uh, let's see here. You mentioned this to me, and I think at, at some point in the future in our busy schedule, because you're gone every weekend, and so am I, is like to bring jet boats doc to bring his bring a couple and we do a walk through and talk to people about this because it is fascinating we live in in river country and i think you have to go like three hours up the road to get to a jet right. boat dealership right. and i have so many people that ask about that stuff and they don't know what a jet when people say yes, jet absolutely. they think of a like a sea dew twin yeah. prop you know but it's did you a, send the picture to me or jared craft. did you send the picture to me or i jared? thought i had one here i'll have to dig it up oh, okay cool yeah, i just want to make sure but i, I will was, i, I will get it to you um yeah because then the guys link link above my head because of the power of editing that that'll have that picture on there yeah um, i'll put that i'll get the boat too but yeah we'll, we'll do a special i think a separate maybe we'll have doc come back and bring his boat and we could just do a walkthrough because i think that yeah and you got the new river handle very well in the new river i mean you shot up some some seams and through, through some rapids that I, I was impressed yeah it works uh real good now i'll tell you what you got like jeff miller and and floyd wharton they have those i mean this river they could run a river, river rocket closed, boats i think uh, brand boats uh those um my goodness 300 horse i mean 250 200 horsepower you know inboard jets i mean uh, their boats are just like phew, it's it's incredible uh and that inboard you can really i think you know go a lot of places that, that you probably can't get with a, an outboard like mine like but that's said, all right depending you know, on the water level because it used to be they would run just with the outboards but um outboard jets uh but now with these you can you can run them at lower water levels i think yeah and yeah of course they got the uh, uhf uh, the yeah the the, the bottom. bottom coating you know i just had you know, that what they call that k5 coating put on mine to give a little added protection but what's that it's it's kind of like a hard plastic just to add some protection you know hmm. to the to the like to a the, shell yeah, yeah kind of like a shell bottom but uh, these boats now are just incredible. Some of these jet boats they have. I mean, they're, you know, uh, I mean, it's it's amazing. You know, it's you just, you wouldn't believe the, I mean, of course, they're, the expense of some of them as well, too. I mean, you know, as, as you know. And to Thomas's point, they're hard to find, too. Like manufacturing, yes. like some of the manufacturers, even they don't make them anymore. And then if you have them, people hang on to them. So when they come up for sale, they don't last very long because, and like you said, because the river, the the uniqueness of a river and the ledges and the rocks and the rapids and the depth, you, you have. Of course, they used to run them. I know that you put a pitchfork on a on a prop boat or something and pull the pin so that 
when right. you're going up river, it would it would pop kick, up kick and it up. kick yeah. it up so you didn't do any damage to your prop. You know, Great so guys, way to lose right? that guys, yeah, because guys, you'd you'd modify, and, and and this is what's fascinating too to me. Why? We're chasing fish. In this case, you're chasing a small mouth. Mm -hmm. And what, what what can we do to get up that rapid that's to get right. to that fish, to get to that hole? You know, and that's the evolution of, you know, just mm -hmm. and how much money we're spending to be able to chase these these little yeah. rascals. You know, I, I think it's awesome. I think it's great. Because look at him smiling. Like, yeah, I, here's what I love about Doc, too. You cannot, he is like a six year old at Christmas when you come down and you see all his presents. When he gets ready to go on a fishing trip, like oh, you can yeah. see it in his eyeballs now and his grin, his smile. Like, that's right. And it's that love when it. you hook that small mouth and that thing starts mm. going nuts and jumping out of the water and doing backflips, you can't. It's like a drug, and he you can tell he's got that. It really is. It's, uh, <laughs> we all have, love we it. all have it. Love I'm it. the same way. So you know? how, do, how do you fish the Shenandoah then? I'd love to get your perspective, like how you approach the river this time of year. Uh, well, this time of year, of course, now you're going uh, uh, to start seeing the transitioning, uh, you know, uh, as here in the – it's, I'm sure it's already going on. Of course, it had that warm spell, and it really, I think, threw things off. And, and then it, when it got cold again, but you know, basically, I, I, you know, you start out in the in the winter, I'd be fishing the, the deeper holes down at the power line, below the power line there, in front row, and I'm down what I call the houses, you know, down before the dam. Before fish, the dam, slack yeah, water, oh, yeah. the slack water deep time, slack water. fish down in there, and and uh, let's say, and then sure as it more. gets as the spring you know is is approaching the fish start moving shallower and moving up river and you know you just you know you start seeing them what move power lines the, it's the power line right there uh this before the oh uh, you go past 66 you're gonna go yeah. down and make your right go yeah. the other direction going down it's right there right there you see that cut right mm, here right there at that last right, ah, right there okay. right there from right there the on dam. down to the dam is uh, kind of where I fish, and, and then uh, so Riverton area. Uh huh. Okay. The river, Interesting. The Riverton area during the during the colder months, and then it seems like the fish start migrating up 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 river, you know, above right into the the South Fork, and on up through there during as you know as the spring comes in, you know, more to play. Uh, the temperatures change, and you start fishing a lot more shallow, you know, at that point, and in the fish will start becoming more aggressive and when do you start seeing that migration generally speaking well i, I mean i think you're you're in, in it probably right now i mean to a degree you know like i said the the weather may you know you may have a cold front and they'll pull back out you know or slow down the the process but and uh, but i think you know we're in it now and i think over the next next uh month it's just going to be probably game on uh, you know, especially if we get, see a good warming trend and that water temperature as it gets up you know and, and persistently stays up in the 50s you know with those small mouth uh i think you're gonna see a, a big run i've always been fascinated by that like how much of it has to do with the change in temperature and the change in daylight i think both of them are very important you know be honest with you uh and uh i mean I, you know you hear some people really believe that that water's got to be 55 or whatever and but then again you know i've been up north and really got on some nice fish pre-spawn when they were coming into spawn but still pre-spawn and the water just barely be 50 or in the high 40s um and but then i think i think that daylight really i mean that's you know that you, know, the, you get to increase uh day length um i think that's yeah that, i think that's important too i don't know which is which is the most important, but I, you know, I think both of them are, are factors. You look at Mother you know. Nature when it yeah. starts budding, you see the trees and right. the different things. Dog and we've seen a little bit yeah. early this year, but, but what I think, and I think, and I'm not an expert by any means, these river guides really, I mean, they're on the world every day. They see it happening, but to me too, it's nothing happens right at the same time. So there's windows and they're not all going to go up and spawn at the same time, mm -hmm. but you like you, they're definitely out of their winning holes now and they'll start to push up right outside the shallow and I think you're right too. Like this, and March is funny anymore. And we've really seen a transition in weather in our area too, from like colder, like warmer Februarys, you know, essentially than March is just March is always just it's up and down, you know, as far as t water temperature. Right. But um, I think that messes with them sometimes. Where because like I said, you're right too. I think consistency. Once you find that consistent water temperature, it might get up and spike and hit 50, but then you drop back down to 47, 48. Yeah. Get a cold rain. 
But once you start creeping up into a stable 54, yep. 52, 54, that I think that and they're waiting, they're getting ready, then they're going to go up and I think that's the key. Really, you know, stabilization. Start, yeah. For example, just getting back from the, that uh, Pickwick fishing at Pickwick, there's a famous uh, spawning flat for the uh, smallmouth there called the horseshoe, and and this uh, and of course uh, when I was down there when I got there, I. The day I get there, the, the, the weather turns cold, but um, the water temperature was about 54 degrees, and I caught some really nice smallmouth, you know, on that transition highway from the, hmm. the deeper, some of the deeper holes down river, moving towards that horseshoe. Uh, and I mean, you know, within, you know, a uh, quarter of a mile or of the dam, I mean, you know, there was a lot of transitioning fish moving right. towards those spawning of course the water was in the, the in the in the low 50s right. and and had been there it's kind of it been it actually had been warmer and the cold front pulled it down but it was still like you said you're consistently still in the 50s so right. you know moving moving on and i tell you, you no know, i just still I'm, again i'm fascinated by just the i mean fish it and it's they the last you know when we had talking about catfish also running laps or you know taking laps that we heard jeff little talk about this but this idea i think in the river what i see is and it's not that wide but from middle to bank basically you know what i mean like it's it's you got to fish all of it you know that fish this hour might be 10 foot off the bank you know the mm -hmm. next hour and the 12 o'clock hour it might be nose to the right. bank eating on some crayfish or bugs or a fly right. hatch and then the next hour after that it might circle back and you know be back in that you know 12 foot water or whatever right. so, i mean it it's so random i think we try to pattern them to like they're going to stay on a spot on a mark and fish no, truly you hear them on tv all the time the fish are swimming away from them or you know i mean it's just a, they are swimming they're swimming and they're moving and so sometimes it's hard we try, try to and i mean transition so hard though thomas like the only mm. thing that's constant is that nothing stays the same no, exactly right? and you have to like live in the moment and yeah. right you know you know we talked about this with chris gorgas and and mike um was the fact that people always want to know you know what to fish mm -hmm. and and chris talked about like when he would go kayaking with jeff little mm -hmm. and he said like kayak fishermen have a great advantage because they have to fish an area and they're set that's right and he said sometimes when you have a jet boat or a 250 mercury like you're i right. have mm -hmm. you're like you have this thing in your brain it's like well i, I gotta use the motor i just yeah. bought this thing gotta i gotta go, go somewhere yeah. you know yeah. if i go 400 miles this yeah. way that's that's right. they're biting yeah that's, that's where right. they're biting but yeah. but kayak anglers the japanese anglers you know yeah. japan they have like one lake in the country yeah. you fish it. here they're right. sliding 20 feet not yes yeah, 40. yes Yes. And so right. I think it's an issue that when I fished my first kayak tournament last year on the Shenandoah and I was fishing the main stem, I'm like, this is it. I am not getting in the car and moving. And what I figured out is like, okay, they slid out. Yeah, they were on point. the bank in the morning and I was hitting them with a crankbait. And what I did is I left them and I just, I paddled back into the same pool, but I fished a little bit deeper. I caught them again. If I had a jet boat, I would not have figured that out. I would have left to try to duplicate it, not just refigure them out. Gosh, and then, you know, you just did live, live scope deal. And I was watching the classic a little before we came on and just how, and they were laughing at how like they're watching the graph, like the video game. And they're, oh, there's two fish right there. Oh, 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 up. And, it, you know, and so there's, and they're, they're watching this. But if, if we don't have that technology, we were actually on fish they also just weren't eating and then we think oh they're just not here well no they're they were there they just they weren't in that eating window either so how do you approach because you've gone all over the place how do you approach new river like okay uh new That's river good, good you question. haven't gone there yet what's your do you do research on it what is your situation yeah, i mean <clears throat> exactly uh uh for example my most recent trip i mean i kind of uh, I looked at the Google Earth, kind of looking at the area. I mean, I you know I'd heard uh, some stuff on the pot, you know, pulled up some uh, podcast information about mm -hmm. the area, uh, and uh, knew this time of year that uh, there was, you know, was in this pre-spawn, and so I, yeah, I mean, I think you know now you have the ability to at a touch of your fingers to mm -hmm. pull up whatever, and uh, uh, so. Uh, Bass University, I this I don't know if y'all uh, good information. Yeah, I, I they they had a talk on there about the Tennessee River fishing and they kind of went through all the different seasons. Uh, uh, Salsman, I don't know. Let's see, uh, I remember his first name. He, uh, anyway, he's one of the he's on 
working toward the elite uh, group and he's a guide there and he did a very nice talk on the Tennessee River and I listened to that thing three or four times and that's where I knew all these you know different transitioning so by the time I got down there I, I already felt like you know golly I'm you know you know I'd, I'd looked the I knew where the boat ramp was. I knew basically the distance from the boat ramp up to the dam. And I, that's what I do. And I pull up the, you know, I pull up the Shenandoah River. I pull up the Susquehanna River, pull up, you know, Lake Erie, uh, you know, Fishity is another good resource. I don't know. It's a, it's a, I heard of a that, little, yeah. a, little app that I have on my phone. I can pull stuff up. So, you know, nowadays we have, we have a lot of information at our fingertips that we can at least go in there, not totally blind. At least, you know, we can, and, and I think that's a, a big help. Um, and that's kind of, I, I do, I like to try to study a little bit about the area before I get there, you know, because, you know, it's hard, it's hard to step in on new, as y'all well know, it's hard to step in on a new body of water and, you know, boom, suddenly the fish, you know, the fish are not just jumping in the boat, you know, that don't happen that way. Uh, He's for definitely the most a part. student of the game. I remember too, one time he was up a day before I was going to get off work on a Friday and come up and see him on Thursday and on the Susquehanna, I was meeting him up there. And I said, well, I'll call you, I don't know, five thirty, six o'clock when I'm coming through Harrisburg and I was going to go a little further north. And I remember calling him and it's still dark out. It doesn't get light for another 45 minutes an hour. And I'm like, Doc, what are you doing? Like, I thought he'd be still at the hotel. He's already on the water. He was trying to find, and the, those that know the Susquehanna, there's a distinct line sometimes down the middle of the river of mm -hmm. a clear and a, and a dirty side. Right. And he was already out, you know, searching around trying to find that line and like just do his homework before we ever, you know, yeah, started. It's, a, it's, I think that's important now. And I think with the young anglers coming up through, uh, you know, the high school ranks and all that, they're going, they're at such an advantage as far as the technology, computer type technology and, you know, the, the graphs and, you know, the, the live views. And I mean, there's, there's just like second nature to them where, you know, somebody, old man like me trying to fumble through it and figure out how to use this and that is, is a lot lot more difficult but uh yeah it's it's a great it's a it's exciting i mean you know it's a changing world how mm. hard is it to fish the tennessee river um uh, well you know i don't have a lot of experience on it but i can tell you the few times i have fished it it's i try to fish the where it's more river than lake if you will because i'm just the lakes are just really tough for me uh, I just feel so much more comfortable in a river. I mean, it, once again, it, it dates back to how I grew up, you know I mean? So I fish, when I fish, uh, the times I've fished the Tennessee River, it's been around, it's been around the more of the dam areas uh, where it is more like river. So the tail race area. Yeah, the, the, exactly. The okay. tail race areas. And, um, and that's a unique type fishing. I mean, it's different. You know, I mean, it's not, you know, I mean, you got your current and you're basically drifting down through there, your lure at a 45 degree angle of your boat and you're just trying to keep it from getting hung in the rocks but then boom suddenly you'll get you'll hit that spot where basically it's like an eddy in the middle of all that current mm. boom there you might get on a Good fish point. you know yeah. Good point. Yeah. so yeah i mean so once again I, I don't have a lot of you know remember i'm just a recreational fisherman just having fun and but uh you know not that i don't fish lakes i enjoy fishing lakes but my comfort zone is more in the river you know where you got current i love fishing current uh, I did fish Wheeler Lake while I was down there, uh, went out with uh, a guide, uh, uh, Brianna Tucker. She's another one of the, these anglers that's come from high school, got a scholarship to fish at, in the uh, college ranks. And uh, now she's a guide down in that area. And uh, it, uh, uh, you know, on this lake, she found, you know, she was carrying us to places where there was current. Because once again, it is the Tennessee River. So, but you know, we get in that current and boom, she was all over, all over the, the fish. You know, once you get in the current, a large mouth, you know, and. How do you deal with that, with that heavier current though? Like, I think all of us, when we think the Shenandoah river, it's not necessarily like the Tennessee where they open up the dam and that, that sucker's ripping. Or, um, <clears throat> we had a, we had a catfish, we had junior cat daddy and he talked about using a 10 ounce sinker on the dead center of the Potomac because the current's so bad. And I wanted to relate that back to bass fishing. When the current gets up, and it doesn't even have to be the tail race, it could be the Shenandoah. When you're dealing with really hard ripping current, do you make any adjustments? Do you have to oh, make yeah. adjustments? I mean, I I, I think of the guy, of the circle that, that I tend to fish most with, I'm probably the the heavy the heavy fisherman. I mean, they'll be using, you know, three sixteenths and I'll be using quarter. 
and I'll go, you know, that's probably my comfort zone fishing the Shenandoah, Potomac, even so in the Susquehanna is, is probably, uh, at least a quarter, you know, a quarter ounce. Uh, and I have gone up three eighths ounce, you know, really? before. Uh, so I fish heavier probably than, than a lot of people do. I like to feel that bottom and, you know, I like, I use braid line and with fluoro, usually with fluoro leader. And so I can really, you know, I, it's, I, I guess that's just kind of, uh, I've, develop that um that you know that sensation you know that that Beautiful. bottom bottom touch with that using the the sensitive line and and then the heavier um uh, but i mean you know your guides and all from around here these excellent anglers and on the susquehanna they'll tell you they're using the lightest thing they can get by with you know to bounce but and you know and i and not that i don't fish like that some but i, <clears throat> I typically i'm fishing a little heavier and you've talked um, about like you even before you went. I remember you were talking about a three quarter round spinner bait. I think you oh, were yeah. looking for oh, like we're oh, saying was, we don't carry anything ounce, big, but ounce, like ounce. He's, so I know that you're thinking about it. And you, like to your point, he's you're considering that and know that you're going to have to go heavy. And, like the and, jackhammer, you know, I yeah. love fishing with the jackhammer, and I my go to jackhammer is a, a half ounce. I mean, you know, it, it don't matter how deep the water is, yeah. whether it's a foot or ten foot. You know, I'm that's the that's the size I, you know, I like throwing the heavier stuff. That's just kind of a personal preference, I guess. Yeah. And I know the heavier stuff's important. Um, I think Steve Kennedy won a tournament or came close fishing the tail races with a two ounce custom spinner bait because the current was, was so ripping. And then, you know, huge shout out to Chris Kendrick of uh, CC custom spinner baits. He's now just come out with a one ounce spinner bait, you know, specifically for those heavier current. And I think that's fascinating where it's like those little adjustments where, yeah, when the current's ripping, you still need to make some kind of contact right. because you can pick up the bite. Um, and I experimented with this guys with, you know, my, my BFS Ned rig setup where I'm using a Japanese style, uh, micro just jig head with the Ned rig, but it's a little bit heavier. So when I, when I, when I throw it out there, I know when it hits bottom and I know when I pick it up, it'll drift and then it'll hit bottom again. And it makes it easier to distinguish the bite. Cause when you go too light, it does get harder to really know if a smallmouth pick that up or if you're snagged on something. Even getting down, you're right. Cause like <clears throat> he was alluded to too, when you throw in, you don't realize that if that current is swift moving you throw here and like you're talking about a 45 like you are it, it may never hit the bottom right. if it's moving fast so you're right. only fishing you know the top mm -hmm. you know quarter Both third of the, the top water right. column it's never getting down so and there's the times the that i think you want to work that eddy a little bit more efficiently um I, I know we talked about like drifting it through but you know again gene just really opened my eyes that you know if you can move a, a, t a six ounce sinker and current imagine your your one fourth ounce ned rig how fast is that moving past and depending if the smallmouth aren't active you know you could have an eddy and only have one active fish at a four or five cranking up the weight on that thing just so that way you can actually let it soak in that eddy a little bit longer is important right so good don't stuff, let them kid you, you know. too about the green fish and lake we had we used to do small tournaments up at lake holiday and 10 or 12 boats and <laughs> Son of a gun comes up there and enters and wins it, wins Whoa, it all. Oh, I need to hear this. I and then retires. Story. It's his yeah. first tournament <laughs> last year. He retires that's and he right. rides off yeah. sunset. I've, I've, I've that was just too easy, boys. One fishing tournament. And I, and, and that's, and I <laughs> what happened? Say, well, it was the deal. Uh, Kenny <laughs> Gano and I was up there, uh, went to, uh, we was just going up fish one evening uh, up on Lake Holiday and come find out they were having a tournament that night. We, of course, we didn't know. All the boats, the guys were out there and said, y'all want to get in on tournament? And me and Kenny said, well, we're fishing anyway. Why not? So we did. We entered to pay our entry fee, and and darn if me and him, we got on some nice fish. We had I don't know how much we had, I don't know eighteen or eighteen or so pounds out of bag Lake Holiday, night, out of Lake uh, Lake Holiday at that night. And I think our big fish had like a, a five five largemouth that night. So come find out, we ended up winning the tournament and the big fish. I said I'm quitting right That's here. Right, so I, I I can truthfully say I've I've won every tournament I've ever fished <laughs> right. in. Finished on top. Hundred percent. Yeah. Well what did you catch them on? Do you remember? Uh I was using a uh like a creature uh uh, uh creature bug, you know, type Texas lure. rig uh, dragging it. Yeah, just yeah, just Texas rig. I had a Texas rig and uh and was using rubber worms, tequila colored hmm. rubber worms great night great night fishing one of my better nights up there on that lake i didn't know they had that kind of weight in holiday uh, it used to, and it used to be i mean it'll come back like a lot of things but you back in the day it used to oh be quite the fishery really oh, they're yeah. still in there they're just you know obviously you've heard us say before but yeah it's getting taking better taking the grass out they've pushed out and they're 
they're I'm, out deep. And, I'm looking forward over the next, yeah, next several couple. years. Talk, talk about that a little bit just for people that haven't uh, listened to some of our, I know like the first, the last Lake Holiday episode we did was like episode three and we're on like 110. So Lake Holiday, you know, it's, it's in, it's in Winchester. It's about a hundred acres. Um, I'll bring it up on, on Google earth here in a minute. But it used to two, actually two fifty. Two fifty. Yeah, is it is it 250, bigger or smaller than Lake Frederick? Bigger, bigger or smaller? It's bigger. bigger. Yeah, two hundred fifty. Oh, I didn't know that. Sets oh, wow. up as a big uh it's <clears throat> got big gorge lake. I mean what, 80, yeah, 85 like, feet guess, in the deepest. It? Um yeah, it's a deep it's deep lake, deep, deep clear, um, fed by Isaac's Creek. Private, you know, you gotta own a, a lot of people kind get like hosed a highland up. But, reservoir, I guess you yes, would say because exactly. of the, you know, it'd be a highland Water temperature's gonna be a, colder. Um a lowland reservoir. It's a yeah. highland reservoir. Oh, wow. You have to own a like... membership lot or house in it. But it, it sets up nice because it's got a lot of features with points, like big bigger lake features, but in a real small, smaller right. setting. But so how many years ago was this when you when you won oh, all this money? Oh, it's, oh, it's been, been several years been ago. A while ago. It's probably yeah. We kind of stopped doing tournaments for that reason. Not yeah. that reason, but when so they lowered the dam, the history on it for those that maybe just tuning in, had to lower the dam to fix it. So they lowered the water, not lower the dam, lower the water to fix the dam. And it dropped about ten foot, I think. So everything pulls back, grass went dormant, you know, all the bait uh, fish, everything okay. goes down. And then once they filled it back up, uh, and this was a mistake. I don't care what anybody says. It was a mistake, um, hindsight, but they s put grass carp in to control vegetation. They felt like they had too much of a hydrilla problem. Um, don't care who made the mistake. Doesn't matter. But basically they, they stocked too many per, they were supposed to be two to three per, um, what was it? Two to three per vegetative acre. Okay. So that was only, that was less than 30% of the entire, because of the depth of the, the fishery, uh, anything over 10, 12 foot is not going to grow grass because sunlight's not going to get down there. So, um, they stocked two to three per total acreage. Oh, so wow. they put entirely too many grass carp in and just decimated the grass population. So I, the combination of those two things totally changed uh, those fish and they all had to pull out. They pull deeper. They're chasing the bait fish uh, out. I mean, you can still catch them shallow, especially coming in. But it's been that's been probably I don't know six, seven, eight years ago that the grass carp were stocked. So we're just now starting to see it come back. We've done a couple, three different stockings uh, to try to help out the smallmouth population. But uh, that's kind of doc. We were you know, and I remember too early on we we went up. They were going to outlaw. Speaking of jet boats, they were going to outlaw jet boats uh, because they said they were too loud, um, and they just they they didn't have a, a true understanding of the fishing. But your wake boat is allowed. Boat. Fifty yes, speakers, exactly. blaring rap music, yes, <laughs> and throwing a wake in the erosion. Right, so um, which we weren't anti that either because each of their own recreational. But the point being is it was just a matter of dock, and there were several of us went up there that had jet boats, and 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 some of them understood, and we we kind of educate him on the fact that in this area a lot of guys have i mean his boat is is a jet boat and he puts that on the lake and on the river and that's and the and he needs that motor though that jet uh motor to be able to navigate those rivers and so he shouldn't be penalized and in the the habits of a fisherman a lot of people didn't realize either you don't run for very long uh on with a big motor you're going to drop that trolling you're going to run for less than on that lake less than two minutes four minutes and you dr shut that off, drop the trolling motor. They'll never hear you until you mm -hmm. pick up and go again. But, um, so just the habits of a fisherman with a trolling motor are pretty quiet. We're pretty, most of the time you won't even know we're out there, you know, type things. That's, anyway, that's fascinating. I didn't know like you had 20 pound sacks to win a tournament at a holiday. Like yeah. I didn't know it used to be that yeah, good. Like, was, we had like, it was an 18, 18 something bag. I, maybe 18, five, that's I can't five really and six like, pounds. But it was a, that's good. Oh yeah. I mean, it was a good, we had a great, we had a great bag of fish. Yeah. I mean, I've been anywhere. I mean, with yeah. some smallies in there, four or five pound, I think six. I mean, there was some yeah. I never saw them on a scale, yeah, but yeah, I mean, they're, they're, I've, I've, seen, I've caught some was really tremendous. nice smallmouth out of the, that hmm. over here. And, and I, some of the guys that's fished it a whole lot more than me, really. That's that's caught wild. some really I didn't nice know that fish about it. Wow. That, that's really cool. That's really cool. So, I mean, did you guys want to get into some bait conversations yeah, first? We'll, we can uh, take a break. We'll grab Let's... a couple baits <clears throat> you like throwing, Doc, and recommendations for this area or river. Sure. And, uh, for yeah. viewers that no, maybe yeah. looking for tips, absolutely. So maybe go grab five. Start us off. Like what? What baits you got? Yeah, there? Uh, I just got a handful of baits here that I I feel I feel that it could go just about anywhere, especially around this area or anywhere for that matter on the east east coast. And probably at this time of year, these would be baits that 
that uh, I would tend to uh, throw. And uh, I start off with uh, first, I love throwing a jackhammer. I mean, you know, uh, and my favorite, uh, basically these two jackhammers right here, one's the green pumpkin shad, uh, that along with the green pumpkin and the black and blue and a half ounce, lo love, love these. Um, and you said jackhammer? The jackhammer. And I prefer the jackhammer over the other, you know, now you got what the slobber knocker and all these different brands of uh, uh, basically bladed baits, uh, bladed jig, uh, bladed jigs. And, uh, but I still think the jackhammer is, is hands down the best one. What kind of trailer are you putting on? Now I usually hear my favorite trailer with Pay the jackhammer is the Rage Tail. Yep. And I, this here is, of course, green pumpkin, but I, I use the green pumpkin uh, uh, with kind of purple the, and gold. Yep. So what's the story? That's, uh, he wore to me, them out that, on them. that's, you know, and you and the good part about this Rage Tail, you can fish it as a minnow, yep. depending on which way you put it on, you know, the hook, you know, where the tail's uh, a like a minnow point. tail, or you can fish it like a crawdad. So, I, you know, the only problem you have to worry about with uh, the Rage uh, rage Tail is it's, it's round. So if you're fishing where you can get hung up, it's not going to be as good is like a creature bait or something that'll slide over the wood a lot easier mm. or the rocks okay. uh, uh, this may hang up a little bit more with this style uh, trailer Great point doc if you guys understand if you put it this way that thing's going to go this way you put it this way it's going to be crazy i mean that's yeah it's that way or that way either yep. way you know ladder so it kind of gives you a little versatility without having to buy a hundred different you know and it's kind of small and subtle, and I wouldn't. It would not have been something I would have picked out initially, but just seeing how successful he is on that, like that's something. It's one of my go tos too, and it, it works well. Hmm. You can actually put this on a swivel head and just fish it alone. Dragging it across the bottom works real good too. I mean, so that's that's just a good general. You can get, you know, good use if you don't want to have to have a whole lot of different, uh, whole, different uh, trailers that you can get by on that one, uh, or at least I get I can get by on that one, uh, and with for what I need uh, as a trailer. Uh, then, of course, this time of year, and as it gets as it continues to get warmer, I mean, you know, you got to have like a, a fluke, mm -hmm. you know. And to me, just especially on the rivers, Shenandoah, Susquehanna, wherever you're fishing, uh, Potomac, uh, a fluke to me is is going to be hard to beat. Texas rigging it? Uh, yeah, or just, you know, you have, uh, you either that or just free hook, you know, to, if you're fishing in shallow enough water, just you can put a, a wide gap, you know, a heavier metal, you know, heavier hook and just use that. And basically it's fishing like a, like a top water almost. But as, as I think, as we go into the spring, that'll be very important part of the arsenal. Um, then of course I love fishing, you know, I mean, uh, you know, my love is is tubes. I mean, I, that's if if I had to pick one bait to use all year round, it would be a tube. And, and show that one up to the camera. Is that a specific brand that you like? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, right bait is a good tube. It's sturdy. It holds up good. And, and I use a lot of right bait uh, tubes. Uh, I use a lot of river rock tubes. Uh, uh, probably majority of the tubes I use are river rock. I uh, just like the, the texture of them. Um, it's got you know, a good just, product. Yeah, it's a good it's it's a good product, uh, and they've got you know uh, uh, the dark erie green river rock tube is I've literally fished it from Alabama to Canada and caught fish all in between you know and that's just a if I had one bait to pick to only use all year that would be the one I, I would pick. Uh, like I said, I love fishing the tubes. I fish them on anything anywhere from. The three sixteenths on up to you know I've got uh, fish up to three quarters ounce you know depending on the current, but majority of the time locally here I'm using a quarter ounce uh, one of Rogers jig heads quarter ounce and just rig it one of Rogers jig heads, uh, but that's you know the tube is definitely probably my go to bait. Uh, I like to fish the Ned rig. I've had some good luck on at Susqu at, uh, on the Susquehanna as well as uh, Shenandoah fishing the Ned rig. And I think we're coming up on a time that the Ned, Ned rig is going to be really good on Shenandoah as these fish make the transition up into the shallower waters. I don't know for some reason that, that that's a, a go-to bait. Um, Why? I, you know, I don't know if it's if it's uh, you know the, uh, they look at it like it's a you know, small crawdad or, or I don't know what what the fish are actually thinking there, but that that small little general and the power bait to me. I mean, there's the you know you got the Z man, 
to me, it's uh, you, you can't beat the power bait. The scent. And it's fantastic. Got the scent. Yeah. Uh, and I love the peanut butter jelly color power bait. That's, that seems to me to be a color that you can use uh, just about uh, any time, whether depending on the, whether it's dingy water, stained water, muddy water, clear water, whatever. You know, that, that color, I, I really like the peanut butter and jelly. Uh, it's one of my favorite colors. Uh, of course, the deal, if you're looking at the Z-Man, uh, the deal color, I've had really good luck with that that color uh, in the past. And I'll tell you what, uh, I don't know you hadn't seen them yet, but I, I was at the, um, uh, the uh, fishing, what was the tournament, the, not the tournament, but oh, the uh, Red Crest, Red Crest, uh, Red yeah. Crest tournament, yes, uh, uh, back a couple of weeks ago. And now Z-Man has a little, it's about a two-inch Ned rig. Have y'all seen that one? That's, yeah. that's micro. Yeah, yeah, the little micro. That's going to be interesting to see how that that pans out. So, uh, be interesting to. I got a couple packs of that. How do you uh, like to fish your tube and your Ned rig? Fish the. <clears throat> sorry, losing my voice, guys. Sorry. How do you like to fish your tube and your Ned rig? Oh, bottom. You know, bottom. Uh, Forty pound the braid. Tube, uh, the tube. The uh, tube. I like to drag the tube. I'm a dragger. You know. Uh, and I use uh, braid. I'll use you know anywhere from eight pound bra braid to fifteen pound braid, and I'll put depending on if there's a lot of rocks or whatever. Uh, I'll use anywhere from eight pound fluoro uh, leader to up to you know up to fourteen or seventeen pound leader. I mean up on okay, Lake wow. up on Lake Erie, a lot of times I'll use I've used uh, up to a seventeen pound fluoro leader because you're in all you're in those 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 uh, beds. You know those. Um, not uh, zebra muscles, zebra muscle beds, and they'll just tear that, tear it up. Uh, so depending on, and like up on the new river when, or down on the new river, when Jared and I was there, I, I think I was using probably 12, really? 12 pound leader wow. down there. Uh, so it depends on kind of, you know, if you're fishing a lake or something where you don't have a lot, I might use the eight pound over the, the heavier, uh, leaders, but yeah, it's nothing to use, uh, 10 to 14 pound liter. And, and that's interesting, like, because we had a conversation with an individual in here the other day. And, and to me, it's like, if you have the financial means, have two rods set up, one with a little bit heavier, one with a little bit lighter. Because I personally think like start heavier and then go down. Because that way, if you do hook a, a fish of a lifetime, you have a little bit better tackle. But if you're not getting bit, you know, go all the way down to four pound test mm -hmm. versus starting out with four pound test. And all of a sudden you do, you hook a giant. And yes, you, I've caught tons of big fish on four pound test. However, I would also, it would be nicer if it was like 12 or 14. But that's just my strategy. Start heavier and then work your way down if needed. I just think you don't have to retie as much. Like I say, if you're in rocks and stuff like that, you don't find yourself retying quite as often, you know, these leaders and uh and you know I, I, that's just kind of my preference you i just know? feel like you can you you can set the hook more freely and not worry about it um i know when i fish winter time and stuff in the bite uh, personal preference and the bites lighter i don't care if i set the hook because if i'm using 14 plus fluorocarbon i'll get it back but if i'm using six or seven it's just more of a hassle and when that bite is so light and it feels like mush i don't care i'll just set the hook no matter what no one like i'll just pull the log up and, and undo it Again, personal preference, but I think it is fascinating the strategy. Well, weight could be too, because I, I keep when you're talking about that, I'm also thinking about how how heavy you're going, like you talked about earlier. And if you are he throwing heavier to get down deeper, or you're dragging, like you're saying, you're dragging versus yeah, I mean, a lot I'm of a times, drag, you know, basically yeah. a dragger. And I've seen where you had to drag versus right, to catch. If really, you were, if you Jigging, were bouncing it, you yeah. wouldn't catch a fish. And if you were dragging, yeah, slow it, you drag. would get same water. You would catch. They would. You would get a bite. You know, Forty five degree angle still in the cast and everything while you're dragging it in the river. Uh, or? Well, I mean, like. For example, even out here on Shenandoah, I've seen times where dragging, I've, I've caught fish when bouncing it, I would not. Interesting. And definitely up on like Erie, if you bounce up there, it was almost a dead Had very little luck yeah. bouncing. That's a, that's, I guess that's why they call it the Erie drag, you know, uh, dragging that tube, or you hear them talk up north about dragging the tube. And that's what I think that's, and that's kind of the way I fish the tube, just pretty much drag it regardless where I'm fishing. Is the tube is tube fishing and Ned rig fishing pretty much the same? You're just switching the bait out. The technique is the same. Well, I think I think it's a, a little bit different in that you know I, I look at the Ned rigging a little more finesse than the tube. Really? Yeah, I do. Huh? Because uh, usually I'm definitely with the Ned rig. I'm using a little a lighter jig head and usually using it. That's where I may look for the eight pound 
you know, uh, fluoro leader versus, you know, uh, the heavier. Uh, I, I, yeah, I kind of use the Ned rig as a little more finesse. I, I, and I know some people consider a tube finesse, but I'm usually power fishing, to call power fishing uh, a tube, if you will, uh, because I'm using heavier weights, you know, than the typical barely be able to get it, you know. I kind of agree with that. Uh, That's so fascinating to me. Yeah. Be able to feel it uh, getting to the bottom. So, but that's the, so then the Ned rig, you know, and the power bait to me, once again, I prefer, pr prefer it over Z, uh, the Z man. Just, uh, I think there probably is something to the power set the max. I believe set. there is, especially when they lock onto it. I don't, I don't think yeah. there's You know, crankbait right now, I tell you right here, uh, the Fritz side, it's hard to beat right now. The, the, whether you use, depending on the depth of the water you're using, whether it be the five or the seven, obviously in the river right now, you know, uh, the five's probably good, but if you're in deeper water, the seven's good. And, and those two colors right there are the go-to colors right now. And that says something. Chartreuse and black and, yeah. and, and, and fire. Uh, those right there. That says something now. to me because I know you all, you go through a lot. Like when I say go through, you try a lot of different brands and varieties. And so I, I would imagine if you're selling in on something, I think it's it's probably yeah, pretty those, good. Those two, I'm, I'm a big fan of those. I'm just getting into the, I mean, jerkbait Floyd, uh, Floyd Wharton is, is really, uh, man, I, he's taught me a lot. You know, just picking his brain about uh, jerkbait fishing. and You and, just and Kenny, started jerkbait fishing? Huh? You just started jerkbait fishing? Well, I mean, I, it's never been a big strong point for me. I mean, I, Lord of mercy, I got a, a box full of jerkbaits, but I find myself, you know, trying to get in my comfort zone more. But I'm trying to really branch out and really get become... You know, Jerry's going to have to give Floyd a bonus because uh, that's that's what Kenny yesterday. Kenny was talking about. And he, he mentioned Floyd. Uh, he, that's why he was asking about the line. Remember we talked about the mm, line, the jerk bait line and stuff. And yeah, and, and Kenny, I, I, uh, Kenny's taught me a lot about jerk bait fishing as well. I mean, I, I guess he's picked up a lot from Floyd uh, in that. Uh, you know, I've been out with Kenny and he's caught some big old smallmouth jerk bait fishing. What, you know. what was your hesitancy? Because me being an ADHD kid, I've Jerkbait was like the first lure I used. Like this whole like dead sticking a tube, hell that, we're going to do this. But you're like, oh, I didn't do it. And just mindset wise, why why didn't you? I, you know, I don't know that I have an answer to that. Uh, I mean, you know, I guess one thing is I really never got on a really good bite with a jerkbait. And I would love to get on a good jerkbait bite because I think that would be, I mean, I, you know, I enjoy, I, I like the fact that, you know, yeah, especially pace. as it gets warmer, you know, you're, yeah. you're moving, you know, it's not like the winter where you got to wait 30 seconds to yeah. jiggle it. And not you know, that's about that tough. Life, no. That's <laughs> tough. That's tough to do for me. But, uh, but I like that. Uh, of course, the, uh, uh the mega bass 110 plus junior i like the smaller because i you know i'm small about small mouth fishing for mainly and i just like that smaller profile bait and that color right there uh mega bass uh plus one junior in that northern star i love that purple i don't know something about that purple that's shimmy uh and that chartreuse that's just a good combination I love and i that. can kind of relate to that as i think when you ask that question it's interesting that i can remember the rapello uh, original minnow like but that was more of a top water summer mm, like yes. drink it down or swim it down and then it floats back up and then other than other than that though that's all I, I didn't really fish the the deeper or the you know suspended ones so much and then you had to twist it the grub twist it, you know single tail grub type thing or in a, in a rubber worm like that was kind of your i mean, back when i was growing up but that, so to your point, that is interesting how I think habitual, I think, I think fishermen are habitual in the fact that we have those confident bait, confidence baits and we use those and we don't really, even some really other really good sticks that I can think of that would just like the swim bait, for example, like when he said, I had the same reaction, like you don't throw a swim bait, like how do you not throw like a contact swim bait, mm -hmm. but he just, he was a big tube fisherman. And it's not, it's just, they just never really ventured out into another, another realm, kind of like being a drop shot or something. You know what I mean? So it's yeah. I just find that always, I, I love getting people's mindsets to everything. Yes. Cause, cause one is I, I, it was yesterday. One of the days I was here, guys, it feels like I'm here every other day now. Um, he said like, why don't you fish a lot of tubes? And I really thought of it. It's like, well, really when I started to get into tube fishing is also when I started to fish the high school bass tournaments, mm -hmm. the Ned rig, the shaky head and the wacky rig is what's going to play mm -hmm. everywhere. And when I would go back to the river, I just didn't make the switch back to the tube. And I think that's mentally it was interesting to me. It's like, oh, yeah, that's probably why the tube, I never caught on to me. But the Ned Rig eventually did is because the Ned Rig still plays for largemouth. Yeah. Same way. 
And that's just such an interesting cultural river rat thing. thing or something. It, or like, it, it is a, personal. It, yeah. It's personal. Everybody's different. Mm -hmm. No, it is. And it's just, I don't know. That, that's, that's, that's so fascinating to me. Wow. And swim bait, that's I, 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 something I'm starting to do more, more of is fishing with swim baits. And this here has been uh, really a, a, a great swim bait I found. It's, it's true bass. Uh, and this package here has a, a variety of colors in it. It's, it's, it's got the green bean, and then this is 99 Problems, then the uh, Citron, and then uh, they call this a sexy. Uh, but that Citron is a smallmouth crusher. Is that really? It really is, the Citron. Where did you get that? Uh, I actually got it. Um, Ryan Salsman is, is the guy I was telling you about. Out of the, He fishes out of, out of, well, he's a guy down on uh, Gunnersville and... Uh, I, did it come packaged like that? I uh, love. Was it was it mixed no, up? I mixed like these that? up you because mixed I, them up. That, yeah, because, because that's a fascinating thing hmm, too. Yeah, like, I, I just wanted to kind of show. Colors, but, but I, I put have. this on a quarter ounce uh, true lock head. You know, it's a it's a got a, a, a screw lock, and man, they they last for a long time. But I, you combine colors, like you took them all out of one and put them in. Yeah, I it, combined this. I made this pack. You made that pack. But I'm, I'm kind of this here is like the why several packs of each and they make this in also and this is a four and a half inch but they also make it in a three three inch and, and uh that's a that's one i usually use on like the susquehanna or the shenandoah mm -hmm. if i throw and i like that uh i like i like the you know the citron and the green bean i'm really right. anxious to try the citron this is kind of a new bait for me i'm really anxious to try the citron on our you know shenandoah because um, i think that's uh like i said that's a that's a I think it's going to be a, a really good bait to how, use. How do you like to use your crankbaits? Are you using it on spinning tackle or using bait caster equipment? I use, uh, well, I, 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 I prefer to throw it on a bait caster if I can, you know, if it's something and that's, you know, and with the advent of these, some of these newer reels that, you know, you can throw the lighter baits, the Daiwa Zillion or the, uh, the Shimano uh, DC, uh, you know, you can throw these lighter baits now and, and, uh, uh, and I like, I like trying to, you know, use like a medium light uh, rod. Oh wow! Okay. Uh, maybe a medium, you know, depending on the brand, what you know. And and uh, uh, Jeff Miller has has taught me a lot with that. I mean, man, he slings that. I mean, he's a crank. What I call a crankbait guru, and he really, uh, man, he's he's awesome fishing that crankbait. Really? Bait and oh yeah. Oh, he's, he had one. It's still right now. I think it's the, still the biggest smallmouth out of the river that we've I've seen. A couple years back on a crankbait, and really? it was cold water, but it was like it was that like was a Jeff six. Wolf Jeff Wolford had that six yeah, twelve, six or twelve, six something. That yeah. was uh, six. No, maybe it was six six it or something. Six six. Because I netted that fish for Did him. You? It was in the dead of the winter. Yes, yeah, it, it was, was like, cold. Yeah, he caught it on a. It was a Berkeley. I want to uh, say it was still like February. A Rapala. Yeah, yeah. It was a, uh, like a uh, yeah. a deep diving Rapala. Yeah. I think but Jeff Miller. Jeff oh, Miller, Miller throws. Miller? He throws. I mean, he's yeah. That's his love is crankbait fishing. And he's really good at it, and you know, just seeing him use the the bait caster. I mean, of course, I've, I've if I'm using a real small uh, crankbait, I don't, I don't have no problem throwing it on a, a spin spinning reel, but I'd prefer throw it on a bait caster if I could. Um, and so that uh, now the jerk bait I like throwing on a spinning reel, you know, hmm. mm -hmm. uh, and it's, especially smaller ones. Yeah, yeah I, I got like a six eight Saint Croix. Uh, it's a legend I, I don't know the exact model but it's it's a real good jerk bait rod and i find myself using that preferring that for jerk baits um, and then do you have gulp on the table i see yeah and that's what that's kind of the last one if you know when all else fails i mean when it gets really down down dirty and hard fishing buddy put this on a, a small jig head mm -hmm. <clears throat> finesse fishing this is a jeff wolford special mm -hmm. right here a lot of fish caught on that. i mean he this is you know he can He's, he got me using this bait you know, several the years ago, out. and I, I've seen fish when nothing else would work, and I've seen big fish caught on these little gulp minnows too. Not not just you know what you think catching one or two pounders. I've seen you know four and five pounders caught Especially on. Especially uh, for Demiki fishing, if you guys have forward facing sonar things like that, that's it's absolute money. And I will also say, if you're trying to get a kid fishing, downsize to the one inch gulp and put that on a trout magnet head. Oh my goodness! Oh, yes. Yeah. 
Yes. Uh, or now they make this, and I think that we've got some of the two inch. And I'll tell you another good one uh, outside the Gulf that I'm finding myself using a, a lot of too. And that's the power. It's the the power bait. The Berkeley. Mm -hmm. The Berkeley. Yeah, that's yeah, a good little yeah. twitch minnow. The, yeah, the yeah. power. Yeah, the, yeah. Those the, uh, are very comparable. And they are. They're good too. And uh, mm -hmm. but uh, this is hard to beat. I, matter of fact, I think that's what uh, Gustafson is. How he's is fishing this right? classic. Yeah, one. I think so. Or what they call I think long lining or. Uh, huh. uh, long lining or something where they cast yeah. out basically and just let it drift to the bottom and uh you know interesting just, then he gets down there and he's doing a little yeah. twitch yeah. and i think it's long line it, something it, like it's, that. Wow. it's a version of um <clears throat> just to expand on that a little bit more it's, it's a version of demiki rigging and all demiki rigging is if, if you want to think about it is you're taking a, a a jig with a perpendicular head tie so if it's straight down like you're ice fishing that thing's going to be sitting there like it's a bait fish hovering and you just hold it there right above their head um, and you really do that when the fish are in a really like negative feeding mood. It's not when they're very active. And that's something that's extremely hot now with, with forward facing sonar, things right. like that. Uh, if you guys go back to Shane Flynn outdoors, um, we were seeing a ton of fish on his forward facing sonar. And he always said they were crappie and they were following his baits up. So I rummaged around cause I always keep gulp with me cause I know I'll catch, you know, if the planet ends, I'll catch something on that. I put in some gulp, tie that little Demiki on it, and I threw it out there and held it above their head. It was a bunch of 12 inch bass. And hmm. so all you're doing is you're mimicking a minnow that's just hovering over cover. Like it's almost crappie fishing is what it is. But you're seeing what's so fascinating with forward facing sonars. This is stuff crappie fishermen and ice fishermen have been doing for years. Right. And now you're finding out from that bass are doing the same thing. Those bass we just never saw or catch yeah. before. It's very similar so, to a, a regular minnow. If you came yeah. and bought a minnow, it's not alive, but any type of action or movement, it makes it look alive. So mm -hmm. it, is, it is strong. It's a strong thing that again a lot of people won't use but make sure you take it off of your hook before don't let it dry oh, out on your hook you'll never get it oh off. that's right that's exactly right and yeah. i like to fish that gulp man i uh on a uh it's a five six st croix it's a medium action and i fish it with like eight pound uh braid uh, and i like using the the bright the, the high vis braid and then i use the four pound that's when i go to a four pound leader a long leader uh, fluorocarbon leader you know not not i mean you know 10 foot a 12 foot leader that's good information that. and uh but it's a you know it's a it's it's definitely a it's definitely a, a fish i like your roger catcher. talk about hearing him doing it because it's always a whoosh whoosh because yeah. when he throws it out there it's just so light yeah. like whoosh, yeah you know, and he yeah does yeah it. that's right and you know use that little he's not gonna jiggle. be upset we're sharing all the secrets is he oh, he's not gonna uh, come knocking on the door not, uh, this is part of the farming i guess <laughs> now and, and that's so sure like, what you know how heavy right. how heavy do you like that gulp do you like to use a super heavy jig head or a light jig head light, light. Put it pretty light on that one mm -hmm. uh, uh what uh three six is it three sixteenths or i'll take your word for it <laughs> I think. that's so awesome i mean that and that may be heavy for some guys that that uh, some guys use I mean, just barely enough to second. yeah 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 and, and, and like you're saying, and, and again, guys that don't do it, it's a lighter rod, lighter line. Mm -hmm. Like you said, you can do a six or four. It's like crappie if, fishing. It's definitely a finesse. It'll throw. Like people don't think it'll throw, but you can get it out there. If oh, you're yeah. Using you the got right the right rig. You can get it out there. I mean, oh, rod and line. Yep. You can get it out there. And like you said, being patient, let it drift. And like and just like you were talking about, get it in front of its face. Uh, it's going to eat it. It's like a spy bait, honestly. It's, a, it's the same kind of idea that you're, you're just being very finessey with it. You're being subtle. And back to your jerk bait you're talking about what, what i think is so cool and listening to you is what's so cool about fishing industry too is there's always something else something new like you can perfect some of these other things and then like oh look here let's you know this is something else mm -hmm. i can try to add to my toolbox to catch yes, fish yeah honestly the bite is always different too the bite is it's a different bite and so it's just i don't know there's there's a lot of growth that can happen within this within fishing too oh um, absolutely i mean you want to constantly and this is when i post anything and people are like well fishing wasn't like the way it used to it's like yeah you have to advance over you know the the tequila worm that you threw in the 60s and, and it's not trying to be rude but the fact is like yeah like the competition is higher even on just a recreational level mm -hmm. but if you stay up with it you will be able to make adjustments and you'll have great days on the water still you can and, and they're still really good fishing and again the shenandoah is back it, it is better than what it's been in a long time you can have great days you can go catch some walleye too that's available to you like fred I mean, last year, people said 
everyone always said Lake Frederick was dead. And then because of us, because of us, we broke it down that like, no, the lake has changed. They're pelagic. Mm -hmm. If you do this, you'll have success. And then all of a sudden, what am I seeing pictures of? Of people catching these massive nine pound fish mm -hmm. on Frederick where four or five years ago they said like, it's dead. There's nothing there. It's like, no, people made the change. And all of a sudden they're like, oh, I didn't know this was here. They were always there. Mm -hmm. They were always there. Um, good stuff. Good stuff. You guys want to make the segue now? Yeah. So let's uh, segue in. You know, again, we talked, you know, Doc, um, I don't know what year it was. Good fortune to go get to, you know, have him as a doctor. And I guess you reach that age. You don't really have a have your own doctor to get to a certain age. But uh, Doc's been, again, just great for our family. I'll never forget, to the uh, one of the first times I visited his office and I'm and his nurse, you know, did all my vitals and everything. And and you walk in, in his in his office, and just a disclaimer too, he's gonna be retiring soon. So I know you know people might think, oh man, I want to get him as a doctor. He's he's gonna be on the way out. But but I, I'll never forget he had pictures, a ton of pictures of like four, five, six pound smallmouth in his on his office walls. And he's also a big turkey hunter too. So he had all these pictures of turkey when he was hunting too. And it's like, and I'm like just sitting there in awe, like gawking these pictures as she get, leaves before he comes in. I'll never forget. She stops, turns around. She goes, by the way, she said, doc's got other patients today too. So don't keep them too long. Cause she knows like fishermen anglers, you know, we're no, no short of words and mm -hmm. conversations and stories. So anyway, doc, you're doing this, this incredible raffle here. Um, so just, you know, tell us, tell us, a, you're all about helping people, in a lot of different ways, but uh, tell us, tell us this, this what, why you're doing this, well, what you're doing. First of all, I would like to thank both you and Thomas for allowing me mm -hmm. to come on on your show, on the show, uh, to pr promote this raffle. And I'd, I'd like to take time to be sure to thank uh, Jerry and and Jenny for all their hard efforts and more hard work and efforts and uh, kind of putting this package together uh, for us uh, for this raffle. Uh, this is a raffle uh, that's going to benefit the uh, American Foundation Suicide Prevention, uh, and it's um, uh, it's something that personally has touched my heart, and I've kind of become involved with this group um, uh, on a personal level. But we uh, we put together this wonderful uh, raffle uh, package that uh, would include uh, includes a either a bait caster or spinning uh, Shimano X Pride rod with their choice of the Corrado DC if they choose a bait caster or the Vanford, Shimano Vanford reel, which is a wonderful combination, probably over $500 value in just the rod and reel. And uh, we got uh, the uh, 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 fishing bag here by uh, Guggen, a uh, Guggen fishing bag and just uh, enormous amount of tackle. I mean, Jackhammers, chatter baits, swim baits, uh, jerk baits, crank baits, soft plastics, uh, t-shirt, mug, uh, several other things. Often start at seven hundred dollars, but as Jenny says, you keep adding. Yeah, to it like every it's, day. we're probably up to well over eight hundred dollars so, yes. uh, in value of this raffle. Uh, and, and like I said, I'd like to be sure to thank all y'all and uh, Jerry and, and Jenny for working it day to day here and Chris uh, at the Winchester printers for yes, printing up our raffle Chris tickets, mm -hmm. et cetera. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's just been, uh, been uh, uh, wonderful that y'all have opened your hearts to help uh, and Thomas putting it on the pot, the podcast. But I got involved with this, uh, uh, this through uh, a walk that, um, they had they have at Stephen City uh, Sharando High School each year. It's uh, it's it's through the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention, and it's uh, it's this is about uh, basically uh, uh, you know suicide prevention. And personally, I got uh, touched by this in, the, in uh, November uh, the tw uh, November twenty seventh, two thousand seventeen. Uh, come home from work, and I get this the most horrible call you can never get as a parent or anybody. Uh, I received a call that my son had committed suicide. And uh, of course, at, at that point, it, ch it essentially changed my life forever and it continues to go on. And uh, my son, he suffered from, his name was Nick and he was a wonderful, a wonderful young man. He uh, kindest heart, he big heart, big heart. 
uh, give you the shirt off his back. He would do anything to help anybody. But he battled this, he battled this uh, bipolar depression, and it's just, a, it's just, just a horrible disease, and that's what it is. It's a disease. Um, and so, uh, but Nick, he loved to fish. He loved hunting. He loved outdoors. He loved animals, uh, wildlife. Uh, he was just a, a true outdoorsman, and uh, he uh, he preferred living out in the country than the, the city life type. You know, of course, having grown up traveling around, living in cities and places where I was in school, you know, he got to experience both, and he was, it was uh, he enjoyed the country life. But uh, lost Nick to suicide, uh, uh, and that, like I said, that that changed changed my life. Uh, and I was at uh, PAX, over here at PAX, after uh, this had happened to Nick, and a car a car pulled in, and they were talking, and on the side of it, it was had a decal about this walk that they were going to have at Sarando School, out of the darkness, and then I got, you know, researching it, it was a suicide. I didn't know anything about this foundation or anything like that. Uh, so I said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attend and find out what's going on. So uh, I did and uh, attended the walk, and I was just overwhelmed. I, I, you know, I, you know, you, when you go through something like that, you you know, it's it, you, you can't explain it. It's just you feel, you know, you feel like you're the only one, you know, I mean, you're the only one suffering from that. But. You know, this walk opened my eyes as we walked through the trail and seen all the pictures of the young kids and, uh, you know, young adults, older adults and of this area that has committed suicide. And, and you know, you just sit there and their families were, you know, obviously there. And this walk was to, you know, bring support to people affected by, by suicide and uh, uh, and those who tempted, you know, had a struggle with suicide and because it's a big thing. Uh, so uh, a little bit about this American Foundation of uh, Suicide Prevention. It was established back in 1987. And basically, um, it's it's the largest private um, organization for uh, promoting suicide prevention. And there, there are chapters in all 50 states. Uh, which is, and their mission is is basically to save lives and bring uh, hope to those that are affected by suicide. I mean, that's kind of the the mission of this this organization. And of course, the core strategies is uh, we're, uh, helping fund you know research, scientific research uh, for you know to help suicide prevention or look into suicide. Uh, of course, educational processes so they can have programs in schools and communities and workplaces. Uh, uh, to bring awareness about suicide and, and mental health uh, uh, and then advo advocacy uh, through legislation, you know, to help bring more assistance in or more mental health program or help in. I mean, because this, this country, I'm telling you, as a physician, I can tell you we lack help in mental health. And it, it's, it's a, a, a big problem in our country. And um, it's... Uh, it, it, I'll just give you an example. I mean, of all the years I was in medical education through my training and through pharmacy school, uh, four years of pharmacy school, four years of medical school, four years of residency training, that's 12 years of medical training, not, not counting just, you know, undergraduate uh, school, uh, uh, college, uh, undergraduate. Uh, out of all 12 years of my medical education, I never once had a class on suicide or suicide prevention. And, and that's, a, that's, that says a lot. I mean, you know, that's, that's a lot. I mean, I've, you know, touched on everything else and seems like in healthcare, but never once did I attend a lecture about suicide. Is it a, is it a cultural thing over here in the West versus in Europe? No, about this, this? Is, this is worldwide. I mean, this is a worldwide problem. Uh, and I'll go through some statistics here shortly, just to kind of give you some insight on that. But um, so, you know, that's kind of this, uh, and, 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 of course, providing support to survivors of suicide and family members affected by suicide is what this organization does. We got a wonderful, uh, 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 I guess, chairperson for our chapter here, uh, uh, Winter Brooks. She kind of heads up our local chapter. She's involved with uh, more of the, I think, 
probably on the national level too. She's also affected by a law, suicide through the loss of her son, and she does a wonderful job in putting this walk together every year. Um, and it, this, this will occur this year, uh, October 14th at Sharando High. Uh, it's, it's, it's very, very touching. Very, you, you leave there and you feel, you feel really good. You feel, you know, like, man, this, I'm glad I went, to, you know, I'm glad I attended. And that's how I felt after I went to the first, uh, first walk after losing Nick to suicide. Uh, and so since that time, we've been been working uh, through my office and and trying uh, and, and and getting donations, uh, having raffles basically uh, to generate uh, money for uh, this this organization. Uh, it's a good organization in that it, you know, 80 percent of the money goes towards, you know, the, the support the, the program, the sp- program support. And only about 20 percent goes to administration. It's not like some of these where, you know, you donate something and then 85 percent of it goes to some kind of administration. And, you know, 10 percent of it trickles into, you know, whatever, you know, the, the program itself. This is uh, they, they really guide this towards the the, the purpose of the, the program and uh, prevention's uh, programs. Uh, uh, so that's uh, that's kind of how I got involved with the this organization uh, was, you know, after my son's uh, death by suicide. But just to kind of uh, just give you a little insight on, on suicide, some of the suicide uh, data uh, I was never really aware of. And, and some of this data is, is a few years old because of the way it trickles in. And but this is uh, basically probably more like 2020 data, 2021 data. But uh, in the United States, there was uh, uh, four, like f- close to 50,000 people died, died of suicide. I mean, that's, you know, and there's, there's a lot of causes of death, obviously, but that's a, that's a big, that's a big, it's a, you know, it's a 12th leading cause of death as, as of that year for uh, was uh, suicide was 12th leading cause of death. I think they're saying it's going up since COVID. Like I heard yeah, statistics yeah, and it too, has. Like it, it, really it absolutely has. Isolated It'll be interesting people, to see the new numbers. Are, are these, in it. But, exactly. you know, looking at someone, looking at, yes. Uh-huh. That way everyone can see it at home. Right. Looking at, looking at someone Jared's age, if I'm uh, kind of remembering Jared's age, in, in his age range, it's, let's see, I think it was the... Uh, seventh leading cause of death i'm wanting to say well in, here in virginia the statistics it's the seventh in your age range it's the seventh leading cause of death and not knowing exactly your age thomas but what i think is probably your age it's it's probably uh, the second leading cause of death in this country in your age range i wonder why that is uh, that is so yeah well you know it's i think a lot of it ties into uh you know the the mental health uh, mental health aspects, and that you know there's the you know it's been predicted that uh, probably that 90 percent of people that commit suicide have an underlying diagnosable and treatable mental illness wow. that never you know that, and a lot of them never get help, and even in in the best cases where they do get help, like in my son's case who had you know had help and. Uh, great support and system and and uh, psychiatrist and uh, you know still was not enough because sometimes that burden just gets too heavy and they can't go on and that's literally what he had left message to me was that he could not go on faking it any longer uh, and so therefore it was just too much weight for him to continue to bear but so I think the mental health aspects of it uh, really comes into play in that uh, you know uh, uh, there's just not enough help. And I and think I'm, I'm not a doctor, but you know, I did, I, I taught health and it was a health educator and we, we would touch on it. When you think about the definition of health of physical, mental, and social well being, you know, in the physical, we'd always talked about it. The physical, you can tell if somebody's physically healthy and they're in, in shape or they don't have any broken bones or anything like that. And then the social too, you can kind of, that's something we can see. Like you have friends, you see people in groups, you're on a team or whatever, but the mental health was something that you can't, you know, and I had, we had an example of Matt Steubing, just, you know, high school basketball player, very popular. You know, he had the physical, he had the, the, the social, but you don't know what's going on in somebody's head between right. their ears. And, and exactly. like you say, whether they come out and tell you or they not, sometimes it's chemical, 
Um, you know, we, right. our family, we've suffered with, you know, depression and it's not, you know, I'm a very optimistic person, but I never thought I would go through it, but it's, yeah, it happens. Uh, it's kind of, you get into a, a funk. I, I caught it and, you know, doc helped me with that and he gave me mm -hmm. some medication, take some edge off and I'm be able to wean off of it. But, right. and I don't consider myself in that category so much as to say the mental, like you said, is not talked about. It's not discussed. We don't know a lot about it. And just like you're saying in healthcare, they're not putting enough, and I've heard that here locally too, and just across the whole country that we're not spending enough money or time well, or energy uh, focusing on that issue and that problem in, in people. Well, and I think it's also has to do with a lot with the culture. And, and an example right now, uh, I'm talking to the YouTube bots. I know that probably this episode just got pulled off because we mentioned the word that we're not supposed to. Um, so I'll say self-deletion because for some reason you're okay with that. But if we say the other word, you're going to probably try to wreck this video. Um, and it's because of like our cultural part of it. And I think another thing that's hurt this is, again, try to get around the bots would be uh, the coof that happened from a country outside of here and how that affected mental health with people having to stay in. Because I know if I say another word, this thing automatically out of a two hour video will get shut down immediately. Oh yeah, absolutely. I have a, there's a list of words that if I say it, they, they target it. So in one sense, even though I could probably put in the title of this video, this specific uh, nonprofit, it might still get flagged. And so this will be fun. I'll, I'll figure out a way around it, but it's just like to kind of like piggyback with what you said. This is how our culture is, which is probably not the healthiest thing. And I do wonder because of what happened with a couple of years ago and people being indoors, did that make it worse right. in young people? I don't know. And a minute, a minute ago when I mentioned that 90% of the people that commit suicide have some underlying mental health condition. That's not to say that if you have a mental health condition, right. you have 90% chance of that you're going to commit suicide. That's not the case at all. You know, I mean, there's, there's, uh, so that's, I don't want people to get confused there that, oh, you know, you have got depression or anxiety. I've got 90% chance of committing. That's not the case at all. It's just that it's estimated that 90% of the people that do commit suicide have an underlying mental uh, health issue. Uh, and about 54% of Americans have been affected by suicide. It's probably up there on that, li uh, on the, on the board as well. Uh, 1.2 million Americans attempted suicide that year that this data was collected. Um, That's crazy. Uh, about 10% of adult Americans have at least thought about suicide at some point. So, you know, it's, it's, it's just something that's, it's, uh, and, and our, of course our vets, we can't leave them out. It's a big problem with our, you know, and our vets. And I definitely don't want to leave them out. There's, I think estimated 22 veterans a day die of suicide you know, one about every hour, pretty much. Uh, and that's, it's tragic. I mean, it's, it's, it's all tragic. Uh, so anyway, this is, um, uh, just something, and you're speaking about, you know, why do, why the, you know, what leads people to this? I, I think, and I don't know if it's really, you know, like I said, I think the mental health aspects of it, but in through some of the research, they've kind of concluded or postulated that, um, uh, if you really look at the the, uh, the part of the brain that helps us in with our decision making, uh, as well as our behavior, the the prefrontal cortex of our brain, they uh, people that suffer from this or that attempt suicide, and all, they really they there's a a, a a problem there where they cannot really uh, they have a difficult time in finding solutions. So in other words, you know they make a permanent decision sometimes on something that really maybe is just a temporary problem, but they can't process. You know they 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 kind of get caught up in the what's the old saying get uh, can't see the the Force for the forest trees, or, or trees or, for yeah. vice versa, so trees. Because isn't forest. like PTSD and and gray matter issues with concussions and football players, all of that affects the prefrontal cortex. Yeah, correct? And I think all Which, that comes into play. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, that's where a lot of this, like I said, our behavior, our decision making, our personality. I mean, all that. A lot of that's stimulated from that part of our brain. So, um, but it's you know, it's 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 something out that, uh, that's. Yeah, I hope no one ever has to experience, you know, going through the, the loss of a loved one for any reason. But I mean, unfortunately, death's part of living. But, you know, it's such a tragic tragedy to go to have a life cut short that it could, you know, be be productive. And as a matter of fact, they found that, you know, 85 to 95 percent of the people that attempt suicide that, you know, are not successful with it 
can go on and engage in life and, and, you know, get back on track. Mm. So it's, it's just, like I said, I think it's just an issue where we, we need more help with our mental health. Uh, and, uh, we need more awareness. Uh, we need more ag advocacy, uh, to help get programs. Like I said, to go through as much medical education as, right. as I went through, uh, in, uh, 12 years of uh, school and training not to ever ha even hear a lecture on suicide. It's, you know, it just tells you it's, you know, it's kind of, and, and it's, I noticed it's kind of been one of the things over the years that swept under the rug, you know, it's kind of don't, we don't talk about that or, but it is something to talk about. It's a big thing. So I commend this uh, organization for putting on uh, uh, our, their work in trying to promote the suicide prevention and assistance for people that, uh, uh, are affected by suicide and to me that's 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 one of the, the wonderful things about that walk it, it opened my eyes to realize i'm not the only one and it's okay you know it's okay to talk about what we're talking right, about here today absolutely. i mean mm -hmm. you know me it's okay for me to talk about my son in his condition and you know i feel good i mean i feel he would want me to to share this you know uh and to that point, with your research, do you think, is there, like, for people out there that are feeling, I think it's important for people, sometimes people think, well, I'm the only one that feels this way or, or whatever. Is it is it not important for them to reach out to somebody oh, like absolutely. yourself or, or oh, somebody they trust and just to have that conversation with? And then what, what do you, from your research, what is the best well, next step when, before they you know, get to that point? I think one of the, the, the greatest things that's come along recently is uh, this uh, – this nationwide number, 988. 988. That's a very important number, okay. 988. It's a number you can dial. It's a suicide crisis lifeline. All right. And uh, I've, huh. uh, I've actually, as I was telling Jared, I've actually had a uh, patient recently that, that that actually saved his life because uh, they was able to help him, and, and he and literally uh, saved him from committing suicide when he was right to the point of doing that. And so this this number uh, is a very important number for people to know at any time you can reach out 24 uh, seven and, and get at least talk with somebody. Mm -hmm. And like I said, looking back uh, in my son's case, uh, I would give anything to have been able to talk to him yes. just before he made that decision, because I, I don't think he would have made that decision maybe to kill himself if 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 we could have talked. He had lost his he'd messed his phone up. Uh, at the lake the day before it got wet and it was not working. He had no way to really reach anyone. And I think because of that, that, uh, you know, it, it's one of these things where he couldn't, he couldn't reason out the fact that things would right. actually be okay, you right. know, and it's make a permanent decision on a, maybe a temporary thought. Mm -hmm. So, so that number at 988 is important to know. And there's a text uh, message number called talk to it's a seven four one seven four one and I don't that's supposedly a way of texting help uh to get um uh, to get assistance but uh I, th I think the 988 has been one of the best things to come along you know you're not trying to remember some big long phone number it's it's like you know we have the 911 which we're all familiar with for emergencies now it's 988 for uh you know suicide prevention uh, or crisis intervention uh, number so, and guys, again, link in the episode description to everything we talked about today. Uh, first thing on there will be the phone number if this is something that yeah. you feel like you're struggling with. Yeah. And uh, and like I said, I'd just like to to, to thank uh, thank y'all once again for having me on the show to, to tell about the, my experience, and this organization, this raffle, uh, and where the donations w will go uh, when it's complete. And uh, uh, uh our love for fishing, our love for the outdoors, our love for life. And uh, that's all, you know, it all all ties in. And, and uh, I'm very appreciative of, of y'all and, and we appreciate you. the work y'all do. And and, uh, and then one more time, if they want to enter the raffle, what the, can they do just to make sure we live with that yeah, as the well? the raffle, uh, you, of course, can get a ticket here at Jake's Bait and Tackle. Uh, you can buy a ticket. The, the tickets are... Uh, one ticket for twenty dollars or six tickets for a hundred dollars. Once again, this is not something we're trying to make money on. This is something that's going to be donated for a good cause. So if you if you if you do make a buy a ticket, it's definitely going for a good cause. It's not to regain recapture money spent. The money for 
for the raffle as it was a donation and uh, all this money will go directly to uh, the organization for uh, their use. Uh, also, I think it's going to be on the social media. Jared yeah, I think we'll do a address. Facebook Live. Yeah. Drawing's going to be on May 5th uh, this year, May 5th. Uh, I think 12 p.m. is what I'm reading. May 5th, 12 p.m. We'll, we'll do a Facebook Live drawing of that. So you still have time to come down to Jake's and grab your tickets. Um, you can also get tickets online, I believe, too, Jenny, Jenny okay. said. Uh, and then, guys, link in the episode description, everything we talked about, specifically about how you can join the raffle, how you can help. All that will be there. We'll also be doing tons of content as we approach. Um, I'm already thinking to make sure that this stays lively. This episode is probably going to drop the week before or leading up to it to make sure that this is this is hot in everyone's mind and there's not going to be that law before because i know how some people are well i got time so i want to make sure that this is big for that that time going into it um is there any kind of goal financially that you're trying to hit or anything like that no not really i mean you know we've been very fortunate i think last year uh we we raised through uh the whole year of work uh in our office coming up with raffles we usually have a raffle once a month or something through through our office. And that's another place you can purchase tickets is at Winchester Internal Medicine uh, at the hospital. Uh, it's uh, office building number two, suite 200. Uh, we have tickets available there. But, uh, you know, I think we raised over $12,000 last year and just in-house, you know, just raffles, just raffling off stuff people donate, you know, uh, at work. And, uh, uh we had a you know really good year, and each year's kind of grown. I mean, you know, first year when we first started out, didn't know even what to do. I don't even. Uh, we may have had a couple hundred dollars, and then the next year we grew to a few thousand dollars, and then maybe eight thousand dollars, and then last year twelve thousand dollars. And so there's no goal. Uh, once again, any uh, anything that we donate is going to be beneficial because I know it's going for a good purpose and. Uh, you know, so we don't really have a goal in mind other than, you know, um, uh, the more we can, can, can collect, the better off. Uh, and, and with this raffle, it's already doing very well. Uh, I know, um, I think we had some 200 tickets probably printed up. And I think if you go online and order a ticket, a ticket is processed, uh, through here and the, the tickets are numbered and, and all that. So it's going to be a, a pretty, pretty uh, clear cut uh, drawing, you know. That's so yeah, but, great value, as you said, a lot of good stuff, and every eight hundred dollars, and somebody's gonna be a happy winner. Oh yeah, that, the so. winner of this, I, I tell you, I would, I would <coughs> love, right. the, the, uh, I would love to win, have the win this myself. This yeah. is a, this Boy, is that. a, this is a really good uh, combination mm -hmm. uh, raffle here. It's uh, if you love to fish, uh, boy, you're gonna have some uh, really. Uh, some nice, nice things here to use. That's right. Doc, we appreciate all your information. I'm going to say too, like he's been talking about, you know, maybe a couple of years will be retiring, but I'm going to see if we can't get him before he retires to grab a couple of his prescription books or whatever. So we can sell some like doctor's notes, like to, that you can give to your employer, have a doc sign for 20 bucks, like <laughs> yeah, yeah, get you out of work yeah, for a day, yeah, go yeah. fish it go or whatever. Fish so, uh, I don't yeah, know if we can pull that. Prescription to meet not, you, uh, but need to go to the river fishing. Yeah. That's what I always uh, joked about because yeah. the doc, um, I'm not going to be at work today. I got an appointment with doc. They just don't have to know it's on the Susquehanna right. River. Right. So. They don't know we're meeting down, right. to, down to Lake think, or the river, yeah. do they? Yeah. yeah. The best prescription sometimes is to get outside. Get outside that's, oh, that's right. Turn technology off. Best medicine is, is well, I always tell people, you know, the, no saying best medicines laughter and if we can find yeah. a find a, a joy in our life and laughter and 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 stuff that makes us happy that's that's the best medicine there is again yeah thank you so much for coming on and again like and subscribe to the channel guys it really helps us out in the algorithm to help we can grow to hopefully have a better reach to be able to bring awareness of things like that and that that's the key about this you know it's not just about you know it's about the the bigger the reach you have the more people you can touch the better education you can give people and bring awareness yeah to the community like and subscribe to the channel we are fishing the dmv we're the fastest growing fishing show in the dmv metropolitan area we'll see you next time bye you're listening to fishing the dmv with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.